hello, and welcome to Pick 6 Movies. Pick 6 Movies, you ask? My phone slipped out of my hand, was picked up by some lunatic on the street, and handed back to me only after downloading this podcast, you say? Well, sounds like you've met one of our dozens of fans, and now you're listening to a show where two hosts, me, Bo Ransdell, and my pal, Chad Cooper, we pick a theme and then select six movies based around that theme. We put the movies up on the racks, weave a little tale about them, and then come together to give it the official Pick 6 Movies 120-minute inspection to evaluate what a clunker it is. Oh yeah, we mostly talk about bad movies. This is Season 14, Once in a Lifetime. And this season, we are looking at a half dozen movies from the Lifetime Network catalog. Being the Christmas season, and Lifetime being somewhat known for Christmas movies, we are starting with some holiday cheer, in the form of movies that somehow make you feel bad Christmas was ever invented at all. But enough out of me. Let's get Chad in here to make us a little smarter, or at least not dumber, and that's not nothing. Glad you're all here, sorry about the phone incident, and take it away, Chad. So we're really doing this? <sighs> all right, bring in some good music. Nope, not that. No. Let's go with this. Throughout the history of man, there are examples of people creating something for good that ultimately becomes a tool for destruction. Arthur Galston developed a chemical to speed up the growth of soybeans, but he had some concerns regarding its effects on humans, and it eventually was supplied to the U.S. government in orange stripe barrels, and just one Vietnam War later, Agent Orange had killed 400,000 people and left another half a million with birth defects. Similarly, German chemist Joseph Wilbrand discovered trinitrotolerine for use as a yellow dye to turn your pants yellow in 1863. Now, four decades later, this particular discovery found a way to turn your pants yellow for a whole different reason, as it became known by its more common name, TNT, the powerful explosive used to cause death and destruction by everybody in World War I and the sequel to that war, World War II, as well as in numerous Coyote and Roadrunner themed Warner Brother cartoons. Nuclear fission, rocket propulsion, heck, even Google Earth, with all of its immeasurable benefits, was cited as a tool that was used for planning the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks. I mean, all these ideas, they started out with noble purpose in mind, but in the wrong hands, things went sideways in a very bad way. Another example of something good being turned into something bad involves artist Matt Fury. Fury was a self-published comic book author back in 2005, and his work featured four friends who were in a post-college state of their life just trying to figure out what they should do next in the world. Each of these aimless male characters represented a different post-academia stereotype. There was the party animal and the prankster, there was the artistic one, there was the super chill dude, and each of these characters engaged in crazy adventures that were all based on Fury's own life as his day-to-day anti influence the fictional world of his four illustrated protagonists in the publication The Boys Club. One specific scenario involved the super chill dude peeing in a toilet with his pants and underwear pulled completely down to his ankles. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with how men pee in a toilet or a urinal, this is not standard practice. You either use the zipper fly for easy release or you just pull down as much of your pants as needed to get the job done. Now, it's pretty funny to see a guy pull his pants and underwear all the way down to his feet, thus exposing his ass cheeks while he pees. Now, I know this from firsthand experience because a lifelong friend of both Bo and myself named Ben, he did this whenever he had the chance and when he had an audience. Now, as this super chill dude is pulling the full Kennedy, as it was known in my circle of friends growing up, Matt Fury's ultra relaxed character notes, feels good, man. Which is a valid response. Peeing with the breeze on your ass cheeks and knees is indeed a unique and unexpectedly pleasant experience, or so I've been told. 
As this was 2005, Matt Fury had a MySpace page, and he began to post his artwork online to share it with the rest of the world. And Fury shared this illustrated moment of blissful urination and humor as a way to bring unto the world a smile, a laugh, a moment of goodwill. And you know how the internet is a terrible place filled with the worst of humanity, hiding behind anonymity, enabling some to spew toxic poison filled with racism and sexism and anti-Semitism and all the other isms that touch pretty much everything we as a people should avoid being? Well, Matt Fury found himself among that select group of people whose creation was put into the world to be a force for good, but was taken over by others and turned into a force of destruction and hate. As the super chilled dude I'm speaking of was known as Pepe the Frog, who was transformed from a lovable lazy stoner into the illustrated face of the alt-right. The transformation of Pepe the Frog from a super chill dude lost in the world of college graduation, well, it began where most of the worst things on the internet began, 4chan. Now, 4chan is an image board site where users post anything and everything anonymously and with impunity. Imagine if a surly teenager was forced to go to its room as it raged against everything. That's kind of what 4chan is like. Pepe the Frog became the popular symbol for a group identified as NEAT, which was a term that was short for not in education, employment, or training. And I think we all know someone who was probably a member of this group, and most likely they're behind on their dues. The tribalism of the internet took over, and the distortion of Pepe from lovable stoned cartoon frog began along with his freeballing stand-up pee catchphrase, feels good, man which came along for the ride. Early on, Pepe was just the feels good frog, but then somebody photoshopped Pepe's smile upside down and there was a new version, the feels bad frog. Then more versions of Pepe the frog began to appear and his unique face became a template for anything imaginative weirdos could conjure up from the dank fart filled basements of their mom's house. Pepe's visibility made its way from the seclusion of 4chan into the mainstream. And when anything goes mainstream, the early adopters get pissed off. So to combat this, the terrible people of the internet began to create versions of Pepe the Frog in the most offensive and hateful ways imaginable, including racist and Nazi-themed incarnations. Once these little gems of Pepe the Frog bigotry and hatred started popping up, all of the assholes and hateful people of the internet, well, they took notice. More specifically, the alt-right took notice, and what they found was a cartoon icon for their terrible cause. Pepe the Frog became the mascot for all of the destructive, petty, disgusting people of the internet to rally around. The media, which is usually pretty late to the game on just about everything, classified Pepe the Frog as a symbol of the alt-right. And during the 2016 presidential election, Hillary Clinton denounced Pepe the Frog as a symbol of hatred. Pepe the Frog got lumped in with the greatest hits of the alt-right, including conspiracy theories and skinheads, white nationalists, Nazis. And along with this motley crew, there were images of Pepe the Frog dressed up as Donald Trump. And these were flattering enough to get the soon-to-be president to tweet out this representation of Pepe the Frog dressed up as Donald Trump. Some people, including the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign, went so far as to post on their official campaign website that Pepe the Frog was a symbol associated with white supremacy. Pepe the Frog, a stoned, chill dude who once peed standing up with his pants and underwear down around his ankles was a true creation meant for good, but now represented the opposite of everything he was created to embody. Once something makes its way into the public sphere and evolves beyond the creator's initial intent, well, there's nothing the creator can do but just sit and watch the distortion of your creation in the hands of others, which is what Matt Fury did as Pepe the Frog became, well, just another internet meme. So where did internet memes come from? And more specifically, what the heck is a meme? Well, in his 1979 book, The Selfish Gene, Professor Richard Dawkins delivered a cultural history of natural selection where he blended the Greek word mimeme, meaning something imitated, with the English word gene and came up with meme. Essentially, it's a cultural gene. You know what? Let's welcome Richard Dawkins to the Pick 6 Movie Studio to explain memes themselves. Mr. Dawkins, will you break down 
what memes are and how memes work? Memes, mm -hmm. cultural replicators, the cultural equivalent of a gene, the cultural equivalent of DNA, which is anything that's copied, anything that's imitated, anything that spreads around like a virus. Okay. And I actually use the analogy mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. uh, of a virus as something like a tune yeah. that's catchy. Okay. Catchy, like a virus. Catchy. Mm -hmm. um, it spreads around the culture. Oh. I whistle it, you hear it, hear it whistle it, you go out in the street, whistle it, somebody else hears it, whistles yeah, sure. it. Um, it spreads like a, like a virus, and that's all you need in order to get natural selection going. Uh, so I called it a meme. So it doesn't exactly rhyme with gene, but it's so, sort of it's sort of short and, and sounds vaguely similar. Meme, gene, meme, meme, gene, meme, gene. Those don't rhyme at all, but I will agree that they do sound vaguely similar. You know, all of this explains how Jingle Bell's Batman smells made its way around planet Earth long before the rise of the internet. I mean, this is why some versions of Jingle Bell's Batman smells ends with, and the Joker got away, while other versions ended with, and the Joker did ballet. And one person who was raised in a rural area said that the song ended as the Batmobile lost its wheel and landed in some hay. Now, Richard Dawkins, thank you for stopping by the Pick 6 Movie Studio today. And at the front desk has your check for $14 and a gift bag filled with slightly used DVDs of The Cannonball Run and the 2013 remake of Stephen King's Carrie. You can exit through the door on the left. The other left. Thank you for stopping by, Richard Dawkins. Where were we? Oh yeah, memes. Oftentimes, memes are these visual representations of thoughts and ideas and feelings, or more commonly, they're jokes. And they're something born from modern day pop culture. However, memes date as far back to 3 BC. Archaeologists actually found a mosaic in the ancient city of Antioch where artwork was placed in three pieces. And the first frame showed an older servant preparing a bath. And then in the second frame, a young man was running away, being chased by the older servant. And in the third panel, there is a skeleton of the young man sitting with a jug of wine. And beneath the three pictures, the inscription reads, YOLO. I'm only kidding, it doesn't say YOLO. It says, be cheerful, live your life. But you know, it's the same message. Now, World War II, the most famous meme to be found was Kilroy of Kilroy Was Here fame. This famous graffiti doodle consists of a bald man peeking over a wall with his long nose sticking over one side and his fingers grasping the edge of the wall. And it's universally known. Kilroy came to represent the fighting spirit of the American soldier during World War II. And it was reported that the abundance of Kilroy sightings led the Germans to believe that Kilroy might actually be a real spy, leaving his mark as he or she traveled around the world. Richard Dawkins's work popularized the term memes and explained how ideas replicate, evolve, and spread across cultures and geographies throughout recorded history. Then the internet showed up and the spread of memes advanced in size, scope, and speed like nothing the world had ever seen before. Professor Lemur Schiffman of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, good old UJ, well, he studies internet memes. Is that a real job? Hmm. Well, Schiffman's research and observations led him to believe that digital memes are different than non-digital memes because as Schiffman put it, internet memes have common characteristics as they are created with the awareness of each other and they get circulated, imitated, and transformed by the users of the internet. And it is the internet users who decide what gets copied and passed on, which is where things can and often do get out of hand, see above Pepe the Frog. Another example of how portions of artwork can be copied, adapted, and replicated was the work of artist Casey Green, who created the This Is Fine dog, where this famous meme finds a happy pooch sitting at his desk with a cup of coffee as the world around him burns. Now, this two-picture meme is actually just the first two slides of a much longer comic strip. Now, does it matter in this original drawing that the this is fine dog ends up being burned alive? Well, not according to the internet. The internet does what it wants and doesn't really care what the original creators of the content have to say because the original creators can't really do anything to stop their work from being used or misused. 
The internet is a place where digital memes can be tossed at the wall to see which memes stick and which ones don't. Now this stickiness goes all the way back to that dancing baby in 1996, which is considered by many to be the very first digital meme. Now way back in the day, it took forever to download the dancing baby. And when you finally saw it, it was the thing of nightmares. But it's hypnotic dancing was so popular that it ultimately landed a guest spot on the Fox TV show Ally McBeal. Dancing Baby opened the door for Hamster Dance, which featured rows of animated dancing hamsters accompanied by a sped up remix of the song Whistle Stop from Disney's 1973 animated film Robin Hood. Now, if you don't know that song, it sounds like this. And I am sorry. Hamster Dance was followed by Badger Badger Badger, which was a flash animation meme where badgers did calisthenics over a deep bass line intercut with animated mushrooms. Then in 2005, YouTube showed up and provided a lifeblood for memes not seen before in the history of man. Leroy Jenkins, Keyboard Cat, David at the Dentist, Crazy Honey Badger, getting rickrolled by an unexpected appearance of the music video for the 1987 Rick Astley song, Never Gonna Give You Up, is perhaps the most iconic bait and switch meme of the last 15 years. But digital memes were not completely overtaken by flash animations and YouTube videos. Good old fashioned images with text layered on top proved to be some of the most popular and widespread memes on the internet. And you know of which I speak. There's Distracted Boyfriend, the Change My Mind Desk Guy, the Irma God Girl, Sad Keanu, Good Guy Craig, Scumbag Steve, Disaster Girl, Woman Screaming at Cat, Carl from The Walking Dead telling bad dad jokes, Kermit the Frog sipping tea, Sarcastic Willy Wonka, the list goes on and on. And it continues to this very day. But there was one meme that featured a face that inspired thousands, if not tens of thousands of memes leaping far beyond the confines of the internet and into pop culture at large. I am speaking, of course, about the one and the only Grumpy Cat. September 22nd, 2012 is a day that will live in internet meme history. Tabitha Bundensen was working as a waitress and her brother Brian took a picture of his sister's cat and posted it to Reddit. 48 hours later, the image had over 1 million views. Grumpy Cat wasn't the feline's real name. Grumpy Cat was known by close friends and family as Tartar Sauce. And Tartar Sauce was one of a litter of four kittens. His mother was a calico and his father was a blue and white tabby. Tabitha Bundinson was living in Morristown, Arizona and was the owner of Tartar Sauce as well as Tartar Sauce's parents. And the parents were both normal sized cats, but Tartar Sauce was not normal size. See, Tartar Sauce was born with a form of dwarfism and was undersized. Well, you know, compared to the rest of his cat family. And Tartar Sauce also had these back legs that were described as being a bit different. Tartar Sauce also had a noticeably flat face and these big bulging eyes and this short tail, features that were shared with another cat in the same litter. But one thing that was unique to Tartar Sauce was a perpetual downward shape in the cat's mouth, providing her a constant frown and look of displeasure. Yeah, you heard me right, her. Tartar Sauce, AKA Grumpy Cat, is a girl. After Brian Bundinson posted the pictures of his sister's cat on Reddit, the image went through the internet Photoshop mill and instantly started to crank out parodies of the original image as well as image macros. Now, image macros is where you throw a witty catchphrase or some text on top of an image. And within 24 hours, the internet phenomenon of Grumpy Cat received 25,000 votes on Reddit, kicking it to the top of the prestigious front page for all the world to see. That same day, Brian Bundinson uploaded three video clips of the cat over on YouTube. Now on September 23rd, BuzzFeed blogged about the original photo with the headline, this cat is not impressed. Redditors took it from there. Derivatives of this image and the original were posted with that frown turned upside down into a smile. Some people turned it into a smirk. Some people turned it into a grimace. And within two days, over 300 different posts associated with the keyword grumpy cat were submitted to Reddit and more than 100 macro to the quick meme entry. And thus,
Thus, Grumpy Cat was born, and the internet cannot get enough. Within just a few days, Grumpy Cat was featured on multiple photo blogs and humor sites, including Uproxx and the Huffington Post. There were immediate comparisons to the feline facial expression with that of Ron Swanson from the TV show Parks and Recreation, as well as Dwight Schrute from The Office. By September 27, five days after the original post, the website GrumpyCats.com was born and created as the official Grumpy Cat homepage with videos, images, news coverage, and merchandise. On October 3rd, the official Twitter account at Real Grumpy Cat was created, along with Facebook accounts and Instagram accounts. And within one week of the original post, Tabitha Bundinson was able to quit her job as a waitress because the phone didn't stop ringing with calls from people and companies looking to capitalize on the internet's most famous cat. Less than six months later, in March of 2013, Grumpy Cat appeared at South by Southwest Interactive with a sponsorship by Frisky's Cat Food. During the event, fans waited for hours in line to get a glimpse of the famous feline. And media outlets dubbed Grumpy Cat as the biggest star of South by Southwest Interactive, surpassing other attendees including Elon Musk, Al Gore, and Neil Gaiman. Sponsorships with Honey Nut Cheerios, the dating television show The Bachelorette, and even a guest spot on WWE's Monday Night Raw all followed. And reportedly in the first year after posting the original post to Reddit, Bundinson generated over $100 million from paid appearances, book deals, and modeling career. Now, Tabitha Bundinson disputed the claim that she brought in $100 million, but didn't say if that number was larger or smaller than the reported amount. MSNBC named Grumpy Cat 2012's most influential cat. Grumpy Cat was named BuzzFeed's meme of the year in 2013. Grumpy Cat won first prize as the Golden Kitty at the second annual interview internet cat video festival is that a real thing good god (laughs) with all this fame and notoriety it was only time before hollywood comes calling looking to cash in on the sky rocketing fame of the growing grumpy cat internet sensation And in June of 2014, Lifetime announced that they would be making a movie starring Grumpy Cat. And it wouldn't just be any old movie, it would be a Christmas movie, cleverly titled Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever. The movie was written by Jeff Morris and Tim Hill, the latter of which also took over directing duties. Tim Hill was no stranger to making cat movies, having directed the sequel to the Garfield movie titled Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties. He directed that first Alvin and the Chipmunks film, and he also did Muppets from Space. Now, I know what you're thinking, But Tim Hill started out his career directing episodes of the sketch comedy show Exit 57, which was a showcase for the Upright Citizens Brigade, where he worked with Stephen Colbert and Amy Sedaris, among other talented comedians. He wrote for Nickelodeon's animated series Rocco's Modern Life, which was a show that paved the way for SpongeBob SquarePants. And Mr. Hill went on to get writing credit on the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. And if you're looking for someone to deliver a made-for-TV film featuring Grumpy Cat, you could probably do a lot worse. A Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever stars a lot of people with varied careers in TV and film, including Megan Charpentier, who plays Crystal, a girl who befriends Grumpy Cat. She was most recently seen in the adaptation of Stephen King's It, where she played Greta King, who was Beverly Marsh's bully, if you're fans of that reboot. The mall security guard in the film is played by Daniel Roebuck, who I know is the guy who portrayed Jay Leno in that movie about how he beat out David Letterman for The Tonight Show. He was also in Lost as Dr. Leslie Arts, and he was in those Rob Zombie Halloween movies as Lou Mar. Martini. He's got a real steady flow of work over the past few decades. Stand-up comic and actor Russell Peters is Santa Claus for a few minutes. And there's some other people in the cast you may recognize across various TV shows and feature films. However, the biggest star of the movie is Grumpy Cat herself, as voiced by Aubrey Plaza, best known for her role as April Ludgate on the sitcom Parks and Recreation. And Plaza herself was a veteran of the aforementioned sketch comedy and improv group, The Upright Citizens Brigade. Reportedly, when Plaza was contacted regarding Regarding her ability to voice Grumpy Cat, she wasn't too aware that Grumpy Cat was even a thing, you know, because why would she be? She's Aubrey Plaza. And filmmakers shot most of the movie before Plaza even voiced one line of dialogue for Grumpy Cat. And you gotta remember, this is a made-for-TV movie 
for a lifetime, and they didn't have the kind of budget that allowed them to digitally make Grumpy Cat's mouth move, so the decision was made to just layer in the voiceover on top of Grumpy Cat's face. So Plaza, realizing that the cat would just stare, and it would be Plaza's dialogue heard over shots of Grumpy Cat, Plaza decided to rely on her time at Upright Citizens Brigade to improvise all kinds of lines for Grumpy Cat to say. Plaza said that she rewrote about 90% of her dialogue in the movie and decided to use this as an opportunity to allow Grumpy Cat to comment on things happening in the movie as the story unfolds, which ultimately included interjections of Grumpy Cat on top of the live action of the film, fully self-aware of what was happening in the movie while being able to narrate from outside of the movie and also being aware that this was a lifetime movie. Now, in theory, all of this sounds like at least maybe on paper, it might not turn out to be the worst movie ever made. The film debuted on the Lifetime Network at 8 p.m. Eastern on November 29th, 2014, and was watched by 1.7 million viewers. Now, I have no idea if that's a big number or not, but I do know that the movie received mostly bad reviews. Rotten Tomatoes has it at a 27% freshness rating based on 11 critical reviews. The St. Louis Dispatch Post said the film was terrible, but they enjoyed it. The Hollywood Reporter said the movie isn't the worst Christmas movie ever made, and they praised the writing and the acting. However, the AV Club called the movie, quote, the largest turd in Lifetime's crap town of original programming. So unforgiving, so psychologically trying, that the process alone leaves the viewer straining to hear the dialogue over the sound of the soul being crushed wholesale, bone and sinew wretched apart at the joining. <laughs> Ooh, that's harsh. But come on! What would you expect from a movie based on an internet meme? Citizen Kane, The Godfather? I mean, just the fact that a few cat pictures on the internet exploded into an online sensation is a miracle in and of itself. The fact that this led to multiple book deals and corporate sponsorships and licensed merchandise. Tartar Sauce the Cat and her owners were ushered into a life that is almost too fantastic to be believed. Sadly, in 2019, Tartar Sauce, aka Grumpy Cat, died at her home with her owner, Tabitha, following complications of a urinary tract infection and was just seven years old. The announcement of Grumpy Cat's death was covered across social media and news outlets worldwide. At the time of this recording, Grumpy Cat currently has 283,000 subscribers on YouTube, 1.5 million Twitter followers, 2.6 million followers on Instagram, and 8.3 million total likes on Facebook. Grumpy or not, this is one popular cat. But what about the movie, Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever? Does the voice talent of Aubrey Plaza and her millennial malaise add enough dry, unimpressed humor to make this movie watchable? Should we check to see if the alt-right has usurped the memory of tartar sauce as a post-apocalyptic icon of anti-government overreach? And is there any way to get a Honey Badger Don't Give a Fuck About Christmas movie in production as a shared universe sequel? Well, to answer these questions and many, many more, let's get Bo in here to sour his puss, bulge out his eyes as we dash through the snow, over the fields, laughing all the way, as we regrettably bring to you uh, Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever. God bless us. I'm not going to say it. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I am Chad Cooper, and I am with my festive, feline, fantastically funny friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? Hey, I'm great. It's it's me and my puss uh, <laughs> here enjoying the alliteration. You know, it feels like one of those rites of passage. Like, we got to get through this. Now that we've seen it, we've got to get this out of our system. Twice. <laughs> It's true. And once, like, really detailed in a, in a way that this movie does not bear scrutiny like this. My expectations for this movie were in the neighborhood of that Elvira movie, or maybe those 
earnest films, if you oh, want to call them yeah. that. Or remember that, like that Geico caveman sitcom on ABC? That's the quality of entertainment I was expecting from this. I think there's a drop off in quality between those the those three things. I think I think the caveman show is that's pretty <laughs> shitty. It's closer to Grumpy Cat for sure. Taking something from pop culture and turning it into a TV show or a movie is almost always a disaster because for every yes. Pirates of the Caribbean, you get yourself a half dozen Pac-Man the animated series, Garbage Pail Kids the movie, Talking Baby Bob, Shit My Dad Says, Street Sharks, and the Candy Crush TV game show hosted by Mario Lopez. And for we are fully aware that Saved by the Bell's own Mario Lopez is playing a sexy version of Colonel Sanders in a Lifetime mini movie about sexy fried chicken. And also yeah. that level of self-awareness of a, a movie, kind of what the hell is going on, that worked in Scream, okay? Deadpool pulled it off to a gold standard, but this Lifetime shit where everyone in the movie is kind of like winking at the camera because they know that this is a piece of shit, you can keep that wink in your head. And Grumpy Cat pulls that crap as well. This movie really hates its audience and is and is stunned that you're still watching. It dares you to finish it, and when you show up and you're watching it, it comes back almost like Ferris Bueller, like, you're still here? Yeah, right. Change the channel. Go home. Call your mother. Why are you watching this? The movie is surprised that you've stuck with it. It also manages somehow to be rife with flashbacks. In a movie that's an hour and 24 minutes or whatever and every time you come back from commercial it's like hey here's the shit that happened like seven minutes ago that's for all the people who changed the channel 20 minutes ago and went over and watched something that was less shitty and they were like let's go see what's going on in that grumpy cat movie then you come back and you return from commercial and they're like hey you're back all right look let me kind of explain the last chapter it's like a soap opera diane i can't believe that you're sleeping with my brother roger and you've got a gun pointed at me. Why, Roger? He's my uncle. I get why this movie was made to cash in on the popularity of Grumpy Cat. Yeah. But beyond the title, I don't think a whole lot of cohesive thought was put into making an actual movie. Because the movie <laughs> kind of reminded <laughs> me of that Justice League film that Zack Snyder kind of came in and did his version. And then Joss Whedon comes in and he sort of twists it into something else. Because as I mentioned in the intro, layering in all of this Aubrey Plaza post post-production witticisms kind of twisted this film into this mashup blend of ideas and none of it really feels like it's on the same page you're right the Aubrey Plaza narration is too meta too self-aware by half but the other thing is it's also such a weird blend of movies because it's part home alone for sure it's part paul blart mall cop yeah it's part like christmas vacation kinda it's a little bit of shawshank a little bit of shawshank it's got all these weird moments in it and also the magical shit out of nowhere i don't know how we can talk about this movie other than to talk about this movie grumpy cat's worst christmas ever begins with the word grumpy being typed in large white font letters one by one with an attached pronunciation and definition of the word grumpy as you would find in a dictionary and the definition reads one surly or ill-tempered discontentedly or sullenly irritable grouchy and this definition is followed by a line of text that reads does anyone use a typewriter in here mm -hmm. and i don't take an issue with a movie like this opening in this particular way but what i do take an issue with is that all of this happens in about six seconds and it does not stay on screen long enough to let you read the snarky punchline that is the joke they present it happens way too quick and then the movie just begins unfortunately well we got to keep it moving chad we're trying to move some grumpy cat merchandise like larry grumpy cat is chomping his cigar like hey when does the website url go on the screen minute 22 i'm watching this isn't the worst movie we've ever watched is it because Christmas Vacation 2 is worse than this. And that had a monkey in it. This one has a plot, sort of. Yeah, but that one had a monkey that flew a plane. <laughs> and that alone gives it some credibility for me. Maybe not for you. Somebody comes to you and says, I'm going to watch one of these two Christmas movies tonight. <laughs> 
Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever, or something called Christmas Vacation 2 Cousin Eddie's Island Adventure. Full disclosure, I've never seen Christmas Vacation 1 Cousin Eddie's Island Adventure. Uh, In the words of Good Morning Vietnam, I'm waiting to die. (laughs) The opening shot of this movie is nighttime, and we're (laughs) high up in the air, and there's moonlit clouds with stars twinkling against the dark sky, and then in comes some deep red Old English Christmas style font informing that Lifetime Pictures presents in association with Grumpy Cat Limited. And before we even get to the title of this movie, this cat puppet rises up from the bottom of the screen as if to be flying through the night sky and says, Yeah, it's like Wonder Dog and Strange Brew. At this exact moment, you know this movie is going to be terrible. Or it might be awesome. Spoiler alert, it's terrible. Yeah, we'll we'll get deeper into this. But one of the biggest problems is there's all this goofy, grumpy cat shit. And if that were kind of the movie, that's kind of okay. It feels like they're ripping off Family Guy a lot. Like, there's all of these interjected asides yes. with Grumpy Cat doing Peter Griffin type shtick, but there's no real punchline or joke there. It's just there. In this movie, Grumpy Cat narrates the whole film. And if you're going to do that, you kind of need Grumpy Cat to be like, um, hi, I'm Grumpy Cat, and this is my shitty movie. And there are a lot of movies that do this well. Goodfellas did it well. Um, a Christmas Story, if you want to, The Jerk. The Mm -hmm. problem, the problem, one of the many problems with this movie is that Grumpy Cat as a narrator really feels like an afterthought and it's very poorly executed. After we see this flying puppet up in the air and your brain stops thinking, what in the hell is this? We cut to this shopping mall where people are shopping and children are full of cheer and we see some carolers singing Deck the Halls and then record scratch. Yeah, and it's Grumpy Cat busted into the movie and saying... Oh, deck me in the face. But it's Aubrey Plaza. Yeah. And she's just like, like, mm, no, that song makes my tail hurt. Deck the halls. What are you talking about? Deck me in the balls that if I had them. I'm a girl. I don't think this can get any worse. And then the movie immediately proves you wrong because the song I Want a Hippopotamus for Christmas begins to play, which Mm -hmm. unless they play Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, I can't imagine how this would have been any more skin crawlingly unfestive. It's the song that plays under like someone getting murdered in a holiday horror film. That You know, that's appropriate. And so Grumpy Cat then is like, it's Grumpy Cat's worst Christmas ever you don't have to watch it but you might be treated to some high speed car chases immediately challenging you you shouldn't watch this movie you're like a grumpy cat if not for pick six <laughs> movies the remote would have been quick on the draw <laughs> they throw in this black and white stock footage of cars zipping around and crashing with helicopters flying overhead in pursuit and then we see grumpy cat behind the wheel of a car a la Toonses, the driving cat from saturday night live and then grumpy cat says and there's gonna be explosions and then there's stock footage of like like a drug kingpin's mansion getting blown up. It's last action hero footage. Is it really? <laughs> it looks like it to me. It's definitely older because the grain on the film is different. It is so clearly <laughs> like footage that they crib from somewhere else. Obviously, because they, of course, in the movie, they're immediately coming like, this movie's cheap. Grumpy Cat says, or maybe you're going to see a hero in a leotard and a cape who saves the world and doesn't look like a puppet. We then see this failed student taxidermy submission of Grumpy Cat wearing a cape and a mask and this superhero shield with GC on the front. It looks terrible. It feels like that the movie at this point was trying to make something legit, but then they realized during production, hey, this looks like shit. So then they just decided to pivot and pretend this was all on purpose and be like, yeah, what? We totally meant to make this look like crap. That's why it's so funny. <laughs> right, guys? Not since the Marty Croft days of HR Puff and stuff mm-hmm. and the heady days of drug <laughs> has, has has production quality been this good for filmed entertainment then grumpy cat is like i just mentioned all that stuff to get your hopes up and now i'm gonna dash them this movie's all about me grumpy cat this is just gonna be a stupid lifetime movie welcome to it suckers i want a hippopotamus for christmas and then the movie forces us to listen to that whole song uh-huh. during the opening 
credits. And I truly did not think that opening credits could be this bad. I've made it widely known that I hate opening credits in any movie to begin with, but you couple it with a Christmas novelty song. That's really something special, Bo. It's real garbage. Uh, <laughs> and it's just like wrapping paper being ripped. But I'll tell you what this opening sequence has going for it is it stops Aubrey Plaza from yelling at me for a couple of minutes. And I'm okay with that. They bounce Grumpy Cat in and out of the frame. And I think that Tartar Sauce, the cat, a.k.a. Grumpy Cat, that cat died when it was seven. I think it was because of the life it led. Forcing it to go to WWE, Monday Night Raw, and be mm-hmm. in a movie and whatever else. And it, I think the cat just started holding in its piss and it just died at a very young age. It was very tragic. You know what cats love? Changes in routine. <laughs> and being flown all around the country. Yeah. And meeting strangers. Yeah. Cats <laughs> love that shit. Especially if they're the run of the litter. That's <laughs> That's just good, that, good responsible pet ownership, Chad. <laughs> Grumpy Cat jumps in and says, Hey, our movie starts off at this place called the mall. It's a soul-sucking bastion of consumerism to drain people's banks accounts and alienate them from the true meaning of life. In other words, I love it. And we get more shots of the mall and then Grumpy Cat just rises up over the top of this mall footage, disrupting the shot again. And we hear in voiceover, look at me. Can't you tell I love it? I love it because it's evil. I was like, wait a minute. Grumpy Cat's grumpy and that's a given. But is Grumpy Cat also an asshole or quite possibly evil does she work against our hero in this story it's just aubrey plaza goofing i don't know aubrey plaza from anybody okay i don't know if she's funny or not she's not funny in this at all and i don't understand in this movie why don't you just make a straightforward grumpy cat movie have the cat in the pet store nobody wants to buy the cat because it's so ugly and grumpy hooks up with a little girl and then they help each other out the end grumpy cat isn't so grumpy anymore right i don't need grumpy cat to be evil and constantly arguing about who was more unfairly vilified joseph stalin or adolf hitler i would like a shot of grumpy cat as a bond villain petting a smaller cat (laughs) that would be nice yeah we cut to a pet store called whiskers which is where grumpy cat calls home and we go inside and there's all these pets in cages and the music gives us a little steel guitar playing like a prison riff because you know all the animals are in cells and then grumpy cat however is not in a cell and is sitting on a pillow because you know grumpy cat's the star and there's some guy working there reading a comic book and because this movie is rated g um had it been r he would have completely been reading smut porn and this movie would have been much much better what is the difference between porn and smut porn i'll send you some links (laughs) it's it's the hustler line you're just willing to show just straight up pee (laughs) i don't think it's that i think it's that you can see the inside of the plumbing oh i got you it's like right up on the cold cuts (laughs) at this point some snooty gray haired old woman comes into the store and you hear all the animals get excited and they're like pick me pick me so all the animals can talk like the dogs and the birds and the snakes and the frogs and the mice and And the animals can all talk to each other and the pet store clerk tells this old woman welcome to whiskers where the pets don't bite unless they're provoked and i was like i think he might be coming on to this old lady little octogenarian rough stuff is his thing you like to get freaky the movie takes time to introduce us to all of the other talking animals in this movie that do not matter one bit to the plot or outcome of this movie we have to mention them i think but it feels like a waste of everyone's time it certainly felt like a waste of mine there's carla the snake Uh jackie the jack russell terrier Mm -hmm. like a five-year-old named that animal he lives in a cage on the ground yes wilson the parrot and he says hands in the air (laughs) you filthy animal lance the gerbil Uh and then all the while grumpy cat is telling us what an asshole each of these other animals are one by one and why grumpy cat hates them and so this old lady she buys fish food and she beats it and then the pet store animals start giving grumpy cat shit because they were trying to get a new owner and grumpy cat just laid around shitting on all of their hopes and dreams Uh, basically the teenager of the store jackie the jack russell terrier says at least we won't return twice and then we do a family guy cutaway where we see some kid and his mom with grumpy cat at their home and the kid looks quite disappointed at grumpy cat and says all she does is frown and the mom says she does seem a bit grumpy and then the kid says can i trade her for a fish and then we cut back to the pet store Mm -hmm. and so like well that's the first time grumpy cat was returned but we never see the other time no this is real sloppy i mean like why is the gerbil a gym rat doesn't matter it was in the script and they were like well we have this whole bit we're gonna do later how much does it cost okay so he's a gym rat and then we don't talk about it anymore. 
No. In comes a, a new entry into the pet store, which is this super fancy dog named Jojo, mm-hmm. as voiced by Patrick Warburton on, on a Thursday afternoon. It's, it's not Patrick Warburton. It's a, somebody doing a Patrick Warburton impression badly. I'm stunned to hear that that's not who it was. I'm not. Patrick Warburton would never stoop so low. The owner of the store is Marcus Crabtree. He's walking this dog, and when he comes out, this 19 year old kid. Where wearing an ill-fitting suit that he borrowed from his dad. The 19-year-old kid is like, I'm Brock Brockman. I'm the new mall rep. You must be Marcus Crabtree, the owner of Whiskers Pet Store. I'm here because your rent is in arrears. Ahem, <clears throat> deadbeat. In watching this movie, I will credit it. I learned the, what the word arrears means, uh-huh. which is money owed that should have been paid earlier. I did not know that because I pay my bills on time mostly. But then when this mall representative, Brockman, does the... <coughs> deadbeat under his breath you don't do that the first time you meet somebody especially if you're wearing your dad's suit like that it's so ill-fitting marcus crabtree the pet store owner rightfully so is taken back by the cough insult and he says did you just call me a deadbeat we just met and then this brockman guy's like me of course not loser did you just call me a loser he's like (laughs) no douchebag i heard you say douchebag Shithead, are you just cursing me now? Fuck off. Everyone can hear you. Dickhead, do you have Tourette's? I stole the keys to this whole mall. My dad's gonna be so mad. My uncle has the knife OJ used. (laughs) Oh my God. What are you talking about? This child, of course, is threatening to evict poor Marcus, the pet shop owner, because Mm -hmm. his bills are behind and whatnot. The pet shop owner then is like, hey, I'm gonna have all your money tomorrow, which seems highly unlikely. Yeah. And then the kid asks, how are you gonna do that, loser? He's like, oh, I'm gonna sell this super fancy dog. It's worth a million dollars no no what he says is oh i'm gonna make this cat into the most famous internet meme ever and then we cut to this fantasy sequence where grumpy cat is in this zoolander inspired fashion photo shoot it's terribly unfunny and then we cut back to the pet store owner marcus and he says all we need to do is put a picture of this cat on the internet with the caption i had fun once it was awful and then these words frame up the actual face of grumpy cat in the movie so it looks like the meme that you should be aware of if you were watching this and marcus says you put that on the internet and her face will launch everything from t-shirts to coffee mugs to books to calendars to condoms and all this bullshit merchandise starts flying into the screen and then marcus says and after that we'll have tv appearances and maybe even a lifetime movie and he turns and holds grumpy cat at the camera he like winks and there's a twinkle in his eye it's just it's it's just it's terrible and insulting and it's the first indication you have that like oh this is just a big commercial it's all just be sure you get the shirts in there once the url show up 22 where are we 14 all right i'm waiting grumpy cats narrates what me become an internet celebrity wouldn't i need some sort of talent like this guy and then the movie throws some shade over at keyboard cat who makes a brief appearance and then we see a dog riding a turtle And then there is this 16-bit animated flying cat with rainbows in the air. I don't know if being high and watching this movie would make it better or worse. No change as it happens. Not not a bit. Grumpy Cat jumps in and says, none of that stuff is going to happen. I'm going to rewrite the last scene. And then the movie rewinds kind of like Dolomite in Human Tornado. And everything we saw goes in reverse. And then we cut to Brockman, the 19-year-old kid in his dad's suit. He's like, I'm going to have you out on your ass because you haven't paid the rent. Marcus, the pet store owner, says, oh, I'll have it in uh, like tomorrow. I'm going to sell this dog, Jojo. And then Marcus says, this dog happens to be the most expensive Leon burger in the world. He's worth a million dollars. Grumpy Cat jumps in. That sounds like a MacGuffin. Whatever that means. And you're just like, oh, just... Can we not do any of this? I've got a buyer that's going to pay me a million dollars and put this pet store back in the black. And then Marcus does air guitar while his mouth produces the finger riff sound. Marcus is a shady motherfucker, man. Like, that's the kind of what I like about him. Because what we learn pretty quickly is I don't think he's paying anybody. Certainly not on the books. Uh-uh. But also, definitely not paying at least one of his employees. It's all behavior 
that doesn't belong in a children's movie. Because this film is rated G. I don't know why. No child is watching this because they found the sarcastic internet meme to be hilarious. Children don't understand sarcasm. Most children do not use irony as a means to mock or show their contempt, which is what Grumpy Cat does. If you had a child, Chad, that came to you one Christmas morn Uh and was like, Dad, what I really wanted more than anything else was Grumpy Cat shirt. I want Grumpy Cat socks. Mm-hmm. I want a, a Grumpy Cat coffee mug. I don't drink mm-hmm. coffee. You know that because I'm mm-hmm. too young for it. Mm-hmm. But I want the coffee mug. I want a paternity test. Would you just put the kid outside, let him fend for himself? Like, you you are no longer part of this family. Where's our son? Where's your son? <laughs> No, where's our son? Your son is outside. He's growing up feral near the lake now. (laughs) He will get no education. We have wasted so much time and money on this kid. We gotta adopt quick. Marcus, the pet store owner, tells Brockman, the 19-year-old mall rep, the media is coming to the store tomorrow and they're going to do a big story on JoJo and how he saved Whiskers Pet Store by being sold. Top story tonight, some people bought a dog at the mall and it wasn't an inbred mentally deficient puppy. I think the newspaper paper of record here is the mall times because what we learn is that this whole movie is filled with nothing but mall folk they might as well be carnies 99 percent of this movie takes place in the span of about 16 hours and normally i like a good tick and clock movie you know one of those that's like hey here's a day in the life and all the the tension and drama right of a single day's action but yeah this is just inscrutable <laughs> this kid the, the you know the mall representative the guy that manager or whatever after hearing this crazy story about a throng of press Mm -hmm. showing up for this nonsense story about a dog right as he's leaving marcus gets a little feisty and as he walks out the door marcus goes deadbeat under his breath and the kid's like hey what did you say to me are you stealing my bits i came up with that i'll sue you so he leaves to i don't know turn in a paper or get the suit back to the rental place or whatever when he leaves he says toodaloo that that's a dialogue in this movie i mean movie again i know we 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 went from film to movie and even that seems generous but uh so the fancy dog gets shoved in the the front window why he has a buyer most people in the mall don't know that this dog is worth a million bucks that's not what you put in the front window of a pet store you put puppies and kittens or if you're looking to attract weirdos you put snakes and birds well you have the same complaint that grumpy cat does chad because grumpy cat is immediately like hey what's that furry asshole doing in the window and jojo says hey did you see the size of my dog cuck that's what the people want to see watch me lick it now comes the biggest asshole moment of the movie for me all right where grumpy cat introduces our main character crystal let's meet our awful movies heroine hey there she is riding up on her bike outside of the mall as she's introducing this character it's interrupted by actress aubrey plaza popping in and being like she has second billing behind me loser i'm only here for an afternoon i don't know the oeuvre of aubrey plaza i'd never watched parks and recreation saw scott pilgrim versus the world but i don't remember her being in it i know there's a lot of commentary regarding her appearance in the movie happiest season that's airing currently on netflix with Kristen stewart and i'll never take time to watch that but having said all this i found this particular scene where she looks at the camera and attempts insincere self-aggrandizing of her celebrity as the star of this movie by showing her face as the voice of the actual star of this film aka grumpy cat it just comes across as tone deaf and entitled and not even on her part like on the part of the filmmakers yes maybe she said it as a joke while they were shooting this or or recording it but yeah you're right somebody should have been like you know what aubrey yeah that was kind of funny but we can't ever do that because you know actress name who played crystal in the movie is a human being and we don't want to like embarrass her on national television like that but you know aubrey plaza had it in her writer she was going to embarrass a child uh in the movie if it wasn't the lead actress it would have been a relative so maybe this is for the best we cut back to crystal our movie's protagonist and quite honestly this is where this movie should have started without all of that voiceover nonsense that we've endured so far and grumpy cat narrates this is crystal humanity's last hope on the dying planet is that too much she's an evolved organism with a heart of gold my least favorite favorite trait but facts are facts and i like things that are factual you know 
facts like Santa Claus. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> Why are you introducing the idea of Santa Claus's legitimacy in a Christmas movie made for children? It's a fine question. I don't know. I don't know who the audience for this movie is. I think it's you and me. People who subject others to descriptions of bad movies on the internet. <laughs> that is the the target demographic. It's white males ages 30 to 55 watching shitty movies. You see Crystal walking through the mall and it's Christmas time and she sees the mall santa with his with this fat red-headed kid sitting on his lap crystal yells out to santa hi roger and then roger santa waves back and says hi crystal so roger is not santa's name it's chris kringle and his mm-hmm. wife's name is jessica because i learned that in uh, santa claus is coming to town the rankin and bass special Mm. That's the one where as soon as he puts a ring on Mrs. Claus's finger, she gets fat as a beach ball. <laughs> Can he take it off? She can't. She's not going to either. Oh, that's a shame. Like, it, it's like having an affair, but with your wife. Uh, I don't know. Mm. Like, hey, how about you become a greener banana for 25 minutes? Like- you try losing the baby weight. <laughs> oh, that's right. You didn't have a baby, did you, you uncaring asshole? <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Jessica, you never had a baby. Well, not your baby. Ho, ho, ho. I wish you could fit in that prom dress again. I wish you would go to hell. Just birthdays and anniversary, is that it, Jessica? Is that what we've come to? Ho, ho, ho. As soon as I lose 180 pounds, I'm leaving you and getting out of this house. I have a movie we should watch together, Jessica. It's called A Marriage Story. Ho, 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 ho. You think you're so goddamn funny leaving a copy of Gilbert Grape around all over the place? I know what you're doing. You don't know anything about me anymore, Jessica. That's the whole problem. Now I've got to deliver all these toys to children. How about when I get back, you're gone. Order a pizza before you leave. I'm a little hungry. I've had my eye on, on little Lightfoot. The elf? That's right. She's 127. Doesn't look a day over 17. Back in the mall, Roger Santa is waving to Crystal, and there's this little fat redheaded kid sitting on his lap, and the redheaded kid pokes Santa in the belly and says, You're fat. And then Roger Santa says to the kid, Well, you're not exactly anorexic. I was like, I wonder if that messed with that kid actor playing the part. Because he looks like he's 10 or 11, you know, and he's on camera. Maybe he's an adult just looking back on it like, That Santa called me fat as a kid. Give me another brick of Velveeta. Yeah. I mean, when he got cast, the role was probably Fat Kid. I'm cast as Fat Kid. P-H-A-T Kid. It's totally awesome. <laughs> Telling all his friends that. Uh-huh, I'm the Fat right. Kid. I come in on a skateboard. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Back in our movie, Crystal makes her way through the mall, and she goes past the ice cream store, and she says, Yo, Matt, what's up? And then Matt holds up a scoop, and he goes, I'm living the dream. And anyone who says that is not being unironic. It's just, it's a sad commentary on their life. She rolls by uh, Monica, who works at, like, a dress store or whatever she asks crystal like hey how was school and crystal just gives her two thumbs down in a good old fashion <laughs> which i appreciate the people in this mall inquire about her day at school like i said man they're a bunch of cardies it's like they they all came here on the wind and set up tents like they're all into each other's lives they go to the same parties together it, they don't let outsiders in I, I swear to god when they hire somebody new at the sunglass hut they probably brand them outside in the parking lot crystal goes past taco town and she says hola alejandro and then alejandro he turns around and he says como estas feliz navidad which means how are you merry christmas you're welcome Bo. high school french one and two what a waste of time <laughs> yeah yeah you know it's one of my great regrets best you're gonna do is explain to me what kevin McAllister's shitty sister says when she says people refer to him as les incompetents that was french three we did not get there i know what a souffle is We had French bread, French dressing, and to drink, Peru. We cut to this sit-down restaurant in the mall, and I'm guessing it's a barbecue joint because it's got plastic checkerboard tablecloths and everybody's drinking from mason jars. That's fun, Bo. It's like an airport chili slash Logan's or something. (laughs) At one of the tables is this guy wearing a knockoff Buddy the Elf costume, and this is Jesse. And the waitress who brings him his food is named Tabby. And these two exchange playful banner that includes, here's your turkey on Swiss, Wiffledorf. And he's like, hey, I'm just Wiffledorf until I get off work. And then I'm Jesse again. 
She's like, you're always Wiffledorf to me. My feet are killing me. Could you have Santa get me a new pair of shoes? And then Tabby just sits down at the table. And before this can go any further, a cartoon stock image of Cupid with wings flapping with a bow and heart tipped arrow emerges, but it has a cutout head of Grumpy Cat on it. And then Grumpy Cat says, blah, 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 B story, not my line, meow. And this strange little distraction then flies out of our movie. Yeah, I don't know. Is that more or less irritating than the flirting via, hey, let me tell you how busted my feet are. Did you watch this alone? Of course I did, Chad. Who who on earth would ever watch this with me? I watched it with others. And it made me sad for you because you didn't get to experience the moment where you turn and look at someone else in the room and your eyes meet and you silently acknowledge that you were just wasting precious moments on earth watching this stain of a movie. I mean, it was a real like, what are we doing right now? Let me ask you a question by way of advancing the plot. All right. After this uh, head scratching interruption, Uh Jesse, we cut to him talking about, hey, you know, we're going to unionize the North Pole. I'm giving you like floaty elf talk. That's so hot. (laughs) Tabby says, be careful flirting. Last time that ended in divorce. Who's? I thought maybe he was the guy she married and then they got divorced or so. I I don't know. But that's the story I want to see. Fuck all this grumpy cat shit. Let's get into some lifetime divorcees. Grumpy cat flies back in with those Cupid wings and is like, now, hey, you're going to eat that turkey sandwich. I'll be back later. Flap, 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 flap for more head spinning of what the hell is going on in this movie. And then Tabby walks away from Jesse and Jesse says like, hey, yo, you going to come to the party tonight? Everybody's coming. And then Tabby turns around and says, you mean the other elves like the Cinnabon crew? And Jesse says, yeah, the Cinnabon by Cruz Wild. A party ain't a party till the CBC shows up with all the hookahs and the coke and the guns and the fireworks. Those guys are awesome. Not to mention we're gonna have an ugly sweater contest and we're gonna play stupid Christmas games. And off camera you hear Crystal the little girl say, oh mom this poor guy's been trying to ask you out for a month. And here we learn that Crystal, the little girl who knows all of the carnies in the mall, that her mother is this woman Tabby who is a waitress in the barbecue joint. Mm -hmm. But the age difference between Between the two actresses playing Crystal the little girl and the quote mother Tabby is about 10 years. (laughs) I know this because I looked it up. There is no way that this woman Tabby can be the mother of this little girl unless she had her at a very uncomfortable early age. There's a really dark story under this one. Again, the movie I'd rather be watching. Pregnant at 10? Are you kidding me? On the Lifetime Network? I'm there. (laughs) Kids having kids tonight on Lifetime. Before she leaves the so, Tabby is asking Crystal, like, hey, did you talk to any normal people today, not just animals and mollies? And she's like, yeah, I briefly talked to a girl with a locker beside mine. Does that count? Did you really talk to her? I stared at her for a very long time, Mom. I tried to set her on fire with my mind. That takes hours of concentration. Did you speak to any other children at your school and not using mind transference of thoughts? Did you use words from your mouth, Crystal? What about body language? Because I say a lot with my eyes and also just the set of my jaw. Was it the suck it motion where you point your hands at your crotch? No, it was more of a, like, I'm masturbating into my cheek and then my tongue pushes out. I'm here, let me, like, uh, like that. I know. We've talked about that and we've also talked about the thing where you make a V with your index and middle finger Mm -hmm. and you stick your tongue. Don't do that. The kiss. I call it the kiss. No, No, it's not the kiss. It's not. It's not. I don't care what you're your dad told you okay just go to school and talk to children whatever you're thinking about doing do the opposite of that and and get a friend is there a way to not set our house on fire what is the reverse of that oh my god did you shit yourself just a little bit there is no just a little bit you said to do the opposite i was thinking i shouldn't shit my pants even though i hate to shit and then (laughs) you said do the opposite so i did the opposite i let myself shit do i do the opposite or not be consistent that's on me It's on me now. Crystal then says, look, mom, I gotta go. I'm late for work. 
<laughs> you're like, wait, she has a job? No, <laughs> that's a thing. She doesn't, Chad. She's not being paid for this. After she wanders off, Jesse the elf says, wait, your daughter's got a job? Wait, you got a daughter? I was hitting on that girl earlier, and now I'm hitting on you? I don't know if that's hot or disgusting, or both. All I know is Pornhub says it's okay. So <laughs> Crystal goes to just hang out at the pet store, a.k.a. What? her job, in quotes. And she is like, <laughs> like she's growing up mall folk. She knows how this works. Like she's, <laughs> she's not getting paid by the mall yet, but she is mall people. She goes over to that wishing well and just leans back and casually rakes her fingers across the bottom to get her paycheck for the day. Off to dinner at the Cinnabon. She just digs through the trash and looks for the big pieces that don't have a lot of saliva on them. The irony is the evidence of her broken dreams is paid for by the wishes of others. (laughs) At this point, we meet George, the mall cop, and he's hanging out and creeping on this woman who works at a perfume kiosk in the mall. And George is sniffing his wrist which was sprayed with a scent that george says oh yeah when i smell it i feel like i'm in gay perry because it masks my natural body odor with what i recognize as the overwhelming aroma of a prostitute that i used to know named daniela tana now we never did anything illegal it was mostly over the pinch stuff the counter lady is backing away as like quickly as she can just like uh-huh i'd call security if you weren't it yeah that's the problem is that i am security say did you hear about my most recent bust the perp was this 14 year old kid but he had big muscles <laughs> i just want to go home no 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 you can't leave yet you gotta stay here and listen to my story listen this kid with big muscles are you gonna hurt me no, it's all right it's all right i know where you live if you run away i'll just come to your apartment 212 right that's where you live uh-huh. anyway this this uh-huh. kid he had he had quit crying all right this kid you want a pair of uh panties that i took out of the ladies bathroom to dry your eyes no all oh right. my god they're mine i uh, i know 212 that's where you live right now i sat at a lady's restroom i mean your restroom because you're a lady you're a real fine lady you ever worked as a prostitute how much do you charge eh smell my wrist oh god you smell my did you hurt Can... mark is mark okay yeah uh, you know what mark he was a 14 year old kid i know his driver's license said he was 28 but he looked 14 and he was trying to buy these fancy dungarees and uh, I beat the shit out of him because I saw him talking to you earlier. So he's not going to be around very much. So, uh, hey, listen, uh, what do you think? Maybe you and I could go out on a date and you could give me a big sack full of your dirty panties? Oh, yes. Whatever I have to say. I just have to get out of yeah, here. Yeah, perfect. Oh, my God, Mark. I'm I'm carrying a child. So this perfume counter lady, she just runs off. It's a real Wilhelm. I crystal comes up and she says hey george you're not on your rascal today and george says yeah it's an arv it's an asset recovery vehicle why is george on a scooter in this movie at all he almost never is though he's usually walking around he's on it for a couple of shots and then crystal has it i think it's a paul blart cop ripoff it's gotta be i also like the fact that george is immediately like hey you know that bust i made all profiling they say it's uh not the right thing to do but it sure as hell caught those minority kids right and you're like oh what the fuck is happening in this movie he does talk about how profiling is good I know some people don't care for it, but boy, it sure got me out of a pinch. Well, let me tell you, there's two rules that I live by. If he's brown, take him down. If he's white, he looks all right. It's just that easy, all right? Now you get out of here, you little Caucasians. I'm going to go over to Taco Town and have a heart-to-heart conversation with Alejandro. I know he's a Molly like us, but I don't trust him. Feliz Navidad. Mm -hmm. Merry Christmas, that's what I say. We say Merry Christmas in this mall. Feliz Navidad, don't do that shit there, Alejandro. At this point, a trio of mean girls comes riding up the escalator, and one of them has blonde hair, one has red hair, and one has black hair. And that's how you can tell them apart. Crystal takes a deep breath and walks over to them and tries to set them on fire with her mind. But that doesn't work, so she says, Hi, I'm Crystal. We have fifth period together. And then one of the mean girls says, So? And for younger listeners, if you ever find yourself in this situation, the appropriate response to this is, So? So go fuck yourself. And then you turn on your heels and you never look back. Here's something I kind of respect just on a base shitty level. Uh For someone to come up to you and be like, hey, do you want to be a study group? And your response is, 
get fucked. I'll definitely RSVP no to that. Right? That's what she says. Like, it's a complete fuck you. One of the girls says, what are we, nerds? What do we need to get smarter? And then these mean girls leave to go be bitches somewhere else in our movie. And then at this point, Grumpy Cat, who hasn't been in the film for about, what, 38 seconds, chimes in with some voiceover and says, they better hope they marry rich. You know what I mean, ladies? Is Grumpy Cat being sarcastic or condoning unlikable behavior of young women to use their looks to get ahead in life? I don't know. It's almost like none of the, this movie comes together at all. No. It's all a bunch of stitched together bullshit. Speaking of which, Grumpy Cat introduces us to Zack and Donnie and says, oh, look, it's the future of our great country. At this point, Bo, I really began to question if Grumpy Cat was this omniscient godlike character that knows all and sees all. Like Grumpy Cat is not around when this happens but sort of floats in and out of our movie while being of our movie but not in our movie yeah it's very strange like uh, almost a, a feline scheherazade telling you stories of the mall now i would watch that if it was grumpy cat's carny mall stories <laughs> right. i would 100 percent watch that let me tell you about the the guy who worked at the christie's cookie who lost three of his fingers on a tuesday Hey, look, if anybody from HBO Max is listening, contact us. Mm -hmm. We have got your next Tales from the Crypt. Mm -hmm. This shit is going to be gold. And meow, it's going to be meow, a hard R. <laughs> hey, kiddies, that's me, Grumpy Cat. Check it out. This guy over here at Auntie Anne's is fucking a pretzel. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go see what's getting pissed at Claire's boutique. It's a guy's cock. The guy at Foot Locker likes to get locked up, ladies. That guy over at Lady's Foot Locker fucks the lady shoes. He's a pervert. He and the pretzel guy switch places every Wednesday. They call it the weird Wednesdays. <laughs> the mall cops are racist. Wait, that's not a surprise. They're suspicious of the rest of us, but tolerate us because we pay their salaries. You know, they could have explained all of this by having Grumpy Cat tell the story as something that happened in the past. Yes. Let me tell you about my worst Christmas ever. And then the movie would make, I'm not going to say sense, but it would make more sense than what's happening now. Let's talk about Zack and Donnie. Yeah. They're dressed up as American versions of Euro trash rock stars. <laughs> And there, <laughs> there's like a shitty Steven Tyler vibe to the bearded one, but it's like if Alexander Sarsgaard dressed up like Steven Tyler, but with m like a lot more earth tones, it's just a mess. They're in this Zales or Kay's jeweler in the mall and they're looking at rings. And I debated for a moment whether or not this jewelry store clerk was Sherry O'Terry, but it's not, or I hope it's not. It's like Sherry O'Terry's sister. Terry O'Terry. The lead singer dude who is Donnie is like, hey, show me the biggest ring you've got and this lady terry o terry whips out an eight thousand dollar ring uh-huh and uh he's like is that the best you got she's like uh, yeah it's a zales what the f we don't have the queen's diamonds here you fucking asshole donnie looks over at zach and he's like you like this one he's like as if you value my opinion and he's like we're just having band issues he's like i can't have the fiance of the lead singer of dragon trolls wearing something so dainty and then zach makes a tiny dick hand gesture with his thumb and index finger at terry o'terry and he goes it's dainty this passive aggressive you know whatever is going on here you're buying an engagement ring but he clearly has seen your tiny dick are you guys lovers what are you doing yeah i had to go back the first time i watched this i had to go back and figure out like wait are they supposed to be a couple in this it's all unclear but it turns out they were just casing the joint mm -hmm. and this was the moment in the movie was like oh we're gonna rip off home alone and these two inept idiots possibly former lovers they're just looking for something to boost out of the jewelry store right and so these two morons pass by marcus the pet store owner who's being interviewed about his million dollar dog by the mall picayune or whatever mm -hmm. and they overhear him saying yeah not only is this dog worth a million dollars the pet store look we don't have a lot of security it's got a real cheese ball lock so you can really just push your way right in and george then cruises by on his rascal and he's eyeballing zach and don so it's a real layered directorial moment for one uh jim miller or whatever his name is 
where it's like uh, George is watching Zach and Donnie who are watching Marcus. I know how much you enjoy your own personal brand of pick six fan fiction, Mm -hmm. but just to sort of sprinkle a bit of my own into this movie, why wasn't Grumpy Cat the one worth a million dollars? You have this cat who's an asshole. Nobody likes the cat because it's grumpy. Then some cat expert shows up and says, that cat's not just an asshole. It's a rare breed of dwarf cat with fucked up back legs and bulging eyes and a permanent frown. It's worth a million dollars. Right. And when the, the cat gets kidnapped, what the cat learns that she misses and, and needs Crystal, the girl who will come after her. And and so Crystal isn't saving some stupid dog that doesn't really matter. She's saving Grumpy Cat. Or she goes and gets her back and it's she's Grumpy Cat is kind of the hot potato of the movie. But again, maybe that didn't align with Aubrey Plaza's hilarious improvisational jibber jabber that she does throughout the movie. During this scene where Zach and Donnie are slightly wet bandits or eyeing this million dollar dog, Marcus, the pet store owner, looks at all of the people from the media and he's like, you want to see Jojo run around the mall? And they're all like, yeah! Hell yeah! So just Marcus runs around the mall with his dog, surrounded by oohs and ahs. Quick commentary about seeing dogs in malls or pretty much anywhere in public. If you feel the need to take your dog with you as a support animal because you're incapable of leaving your home without your pet, do everyone a favor and just stay home. <laughs> but Chad, counter argument. What if you just could take your dog everywhere? There are a lot of people that are terrified of dogs. I'm so glad that the rules for taking pets on planes have recently changed. When I go into Target and I see people walking around with a German Shepherd or like I look over and I see people with a little poodle in the child's basket holder you need to go home and stay there everybody hates you and by everybody i mean me and i have a dog i love dogs (laughs) i love pets but i do not want to go into a place that is meant for people and see animals walking around if i went in there i saw somebody just walking a cow around i would have the same reaction like what are you doing you maniac leave that shit on the farm dickhead i think that's fair i i think i would be more upset about a cow than a dog in fairness but i get it we cut back to chris still wandering around the mall all sad and lonely you know how she does all the time And then Grumpy Cat prattles on and on with a bunch of unimpressed snark. And then Crystal then sits down on this mall bench and she lets out this big sigh because the mean girls hate her. And then Russell Peters, dressed up as Santa Claus, shows up in our movie. And Russell Peters' Santa hears this little girl seeping out self-loathing. And he says, sounds like the weight of the world. And then Crystal says, wait, you're not Santa Roger. And then Russell Peters' Santa says, nah, I'm just covering for him. While he uh, picks up his mom at the airport. Yeah. That's what he's doing. And you're like, wait a minute. We just saw Roger Santa, like, calling that redheaded kid a fat ass about, I don't know, what, 30 minutes ago? And this guy's covering for him? This sounds suspicious, Bo. Oh, he's a pervert. Right. He's cruising this mall looking for Molly's. That girl looks sad and depressed. Right. Easy prey. Her parents are probably Molly's. This is her chance to get out of the life. But instead, it is the closest this movie comes to, I think, an actual, like, good Christmas movie scene. I agree with that. This is the best scene in the movie because Russell Peters sells it well. Yes. And he's very very casual he's like hey you look like you're a little bit down and she's like yeah everything's terrible and i hate you he's like here i've got this coin it's a magical christmas coin and if you make a wish and throw it in a you know a hole or water or whatever uh then your wish will come true a well (laughs) he also tells her like hey there's extra christmas mojo in it for you if you can make the wish rhyme and she's like that sounds very silly and corny he's like hey it's you know it's christmas that's uh, corny Mm -hmm. is what i do that's what i do crystal how'd you know my name um i just guessed and so she makes the saddest wish any child can make in in rhyme where she just wishes for a friend (laughs) and it's just like oh god you poor kid i get it but uh, you're in for a rough patch santa then as she's making this wish she tosses it over her shoulder into a wishing well and santa ducks over the bench to hide again this is the best moment of the movie where she looks around and then looks behind her and there he is on the ground she and he she says hey you obviously just just 
are laying there on the ground he's like oh that never works you know and it's kind of a nice little moment in the i was so glad he wasn't holding a camera taking pictures up her skirt yeah it's kind of a nice moment it ends with this coin that she tossed in the well kind of glowing with christmas magic and and that kind of thing see you later russell peters it was nice having you in the movie thanks for being the one shining moment of this otherwise just atrocious piece of crap film then crystal makes her way to quote work all the animals react like she's a customer grumpy cat says hey her boots look great you're looking super sexy kiddo and i'm like why would grumpy cat compliment her boots that sounds like something that top build Aubrey Plaza would say, but not something that the frowny face feline would say. And also it doesn't come of anything like anyway. So Marcus is out front. The guy who owns the pet shop wrapping up this press conference outside the pet store's other door, I guess the, the one that crystal didn't come through. He comes back inside and he tells crystal, Hey, I don't want you to worry. You crazy <laughs> young lady. This store is going to be open for a long time to come. When Marcus comes back in, because we need to pad the runtime of this, movie we hear all the animals talk to one another and crystal can't hear all the other animals talking but she can hear grumpy cat talking and then grumpy cat's like that dog's an asshole or something like that and crystal's like what the hell who's talking about my boots and that dog's asshole and then marcus the owner of this pet store starts talking to this child crystal in this intimately uncomfortable moment where he just starts going on about you know my my wife died and i've just let the pet store just go to shit and i don't know what i'm gonna do with my life i really thought that i would make something of myself and i was like is this gonna become a joke but it doesn't it's just a grown man having an emotional breakdown in front of this little girl right and then grumpy cat says marcus you stupid ignorant dickhead i hate you and your story about your dead wife i wish i was dead somebody kill me give me the gas over listening to this shit for brains rattle on about his dead wife and then crystal starts exhibiting symptoms of early adolescent schizophrenia mm-hmm. when she just starts going who said that where's that voice coming from i heard somebody say they wanted to be dead overhearing your sob story about your dead wife oh it's the cat the cat's talking to me please say something again marcus is like forgive me for sharing i just just had a, a moment and I needed someone to share it with. She's like, look, I don't have time for this. The voices in my head are getting louder. And this scene ends with Crystal just screaming at Grumpy Cat, who's lying on a pillow. And she's just shouting at the top of her voice. You shut up. You shut up. You shut up. And Corbin, the weirdo other employee, question mark, of this store, uh-huh. rolls by and has the only legitimately good joke, I think, of the movie. Where he goes, oh, it's cool. I talk to the bird all the time. And then he does the, hey, stick him up and the bear goes ah, stick him up and you're like oh okay well that came together and it, it was a nice little joke grenade that went off a few minutes later i guess it's the best this movie's ever gonna do crystal then says okay grumpy cat why can you understand me i'm like wait a minute this cat's named grumpy cat in the movie i mean i know that's the name of the cat but this is the first time anybody has even referenced this cat as grumpy cat yeah i don't know it's just that, that was crystal's first interaction with the cat that grumpy grumpy cat says i don't know why you can hear me the last thing i would wish for is for people to know what i'm thinking about them because all i think about is how people are assholes and dickheads crystal is immediately like oh fuck me it's that wish i made in the well you made a wish what kind of wish did you make you total waste of space asshole i i like the fact that grumpy cat immediately is like you made a wish in a wishing well i'm embarrassed for you you are a loser Actual lines from the movie. You wished for a friend. Well, yeah, shut up. Wish for a human friend and not a stupid cat like me. I lick my ass and I like the way it tastes. <laughs> Meanwhile, the mean girls from earlier have snuck up on Grumpy Cat and overhear at least a portion of this enough to be like, rightfully, we're going to mock this classmate of ours, one of the Mollies from town. And they're like, oh my God, you were talking to a cat. What a crazy person. And Crystal's like, and just runs off. <laughs> oh, Bo, what kind of weirdo talks to their pets besides all of them? <laughs> right. And so Crystal goes to the mall Santa, but it's her pal Roger this time and not Russell Peters. Uh huh. And she's like, hey, what about that guy from Westbrook Mall that was covering for you? And Roger's like, well, that ball burned down 20 years ago. <laughs> there hadn't been a Westbrook Mall in 20 years. <laughs> no! 
He does have a couple of chubby Asian kids sitting on his lap like they're twins. And they're asking for a Porsche on their letter to Santa. When he tells her that West Broke Mall or whatever burned down 20 years ago, these two little fat twins, they just start saying, ha ha, she's dumb, ha ha, she's dumb. <laughs> and then Crystal just runs away like as the mall spins around her, just <laughs> being verbally <laughs> abused for the second time within the last 30 seconds. And then as she's walking away, we hear Roger Santa say, I hate my life. Which I don't think was in the script. I think it was just a hot mic capturing the actor playing Roger Santa in a moment of unexpected honesty. It was kind of like the jinx. <laughs> oh, I hate my life. Why? Well, because you're doing this movie. That's why. <laughs> we get more voiceover from Grumpy Cat that doesn't matter. And so we cut to later that night and we're at Jesse the Elf's Christmas party where we see Crystal, who is a child, hanging out with a bunch of adults who are drinking booze and they're dressed up in all manner of over-the-top holiday wear. And it kind of looks like an Old Navy commercial might break out at any moment. Like RuPaul, Neil Patrick Harris, little Burt Bacharach on the grand piano yeah you know one person who would never shop at old navy Bo. it's rupaul <laughs> you're absolutely right old navy is the the kind of place you, you go for like a chambray work short shirt or some khakis you don't go to old navy to be fabulous when i see jeff foxworthy pimping out golden corral i'm like yeah that makes sense yeah, right oh that's completely on brand rupaul and old navy Mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I would sooner have RuPaul shill for Bedazzler because that feels more on brand. We're going to make this cape sing as opposed to like, get your khakis, girl. At this party, this group of Cinnabon employees and Santa Mall assistants are all having a white elephant gift exchange. And in reality, it's a bunch of actors being way too animated and excited because they're in a movie. Right. And there's so much enthusiasm. Yeah, they've got extra energy, you know, but they're also talking. <laughs> It's like, you know those distracting background actors on Saturday Night Live that are eating popcorn way too purposefully? Mm -hmm. It reminded me of what it would be like if you had the audience of The Price is Right in your living room while yeah. you're watching an episode of The Price is Right. If you threw a Christmas party, a, a, a Price is Right themed Christmas party with people who had once been on this showcase showdown. Jesse the Elf and Tabby, who is, remember, Crystal's mother and sister and aunt and her babysitter and maybe her BFF she's my daughter she's my sister she's my daughter she's my sister <laughs> out of nowhere a floating orb appears over crystal's left shoulder with grumpy cat inside the orb kind of like glinda the good witch of the east and grumpy cat says come to me crystal meow 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 and then the orb just disappears uh-huh like, does anyone have any idea what in the hell is going on in this movie i mean then Crystal just goes. Like, apparently there's this psychic connection. It's like Elliot and E.T. or Scatman Crothers and Danny and the Shining. <laughs> right. Like, it, she just leaves. And then the mom, she doesn't even notice when her daughter walks out of this house of adults and no. just heads back to the shopping mall at night when the mall is closed and one assumes locked up. Mom sister Tabby, by the way, doesn't notice her kid is missing for hours. Not until her kid actually calls and is like, hey, you probably noticed i was gone and she's like huh what the fuck are you talking about and dude at that point it's about 2 or 3 a.m <laughs> Yeah, she's a couple of drinks in her, at least. They've closed the mall, and it's Christmas time. Uh-huh. And they're having a Christmas party with Cinnabon Coke dealers and Santa's elf helpers. So we're already, what, midnight when this party's going down? All right, let's be fair that maybe the mall closed at 6 Christmas Eve. But this isn't Christmas Eve. Oh, yeah, these are, re these are holiday hours. You're staying open late. Yeah, this thing's starting at midnight. You had to send a couple of the kids from the Foot Locker, the one jerking <laughs> off into the shoes, you had to send them down to the, the Quick Mart to get beer before the place closed. Because it's like, man, by the time we get out of here, it that place is going to be, Marty's is going to be shut down, <laughs> and we've got a party to have, because it's Tuesday, am I right? So... <laughs> <laughs> it's the third Christmas party this week. It's just a bunch of Mollies getting together to get drunk every goddamn night. So Crystal shows up at the mall and she just makes her way inside via an unlocked service door, which that is not completely the most unbelievable part of this scene because she then goes over to the Whiskers pet store where she pulls out of her pocket a ring of keys and unlocks the pet store and goes inside. What series of events led her to having these keys? She 
just lifted him off Marcus earlier, not knowing she'd need him because she's a, a psychotic, as we will learn. It's at this point we see Danny and Zach, they show back up at the mall, and they're wearing these ski masks with skeletons printed on the front, and they enter the mall at night too, and Zach says, they should really lock this store, but if they did that, then we wouldn't be able to get, and he's like, shut up, shut up, and he, you know, Danny smacks him in the head. Let me just, I, I know we've talked about how self-referential humor is going to sink in this movie, uh -huh. but that, especially that kind of shit of like, we know we're making a bad movie, you can't set out to make camp camp happens because of a certain combination of factors that are outside the control of the filmmaker what about the original wayne's world that is self-referential but it is it is a parody of that sketch in a lot of ways yeah that's the only thing i could think of that really pulled that off right and you know like you mentioned scream and and so forth that there there is a way to be meta about a genre or about a specific thing but just commenting about like look in this movie a piece of shit everybody that's not how to do it right oh why did why is the door open i don't know we're just lazy screenwriters and we didn't give this more than three seconds thought right it's the difference between airplane and not another whatever movie right the dna is there but yeah there's shared uh, uh, uh structure and the idea behind the jokes and the silliness and that kind of thing but it's all just completely inept but also so when they're sneaking in this place chad let me ask you this there's a moment where they're like hey how, how come all the cinnabon employees are the last to leave the lead singer actually says well it's because they're up late making delicious sticky buns and i'm like is this a joke or is that an ad for cinnabon in the middle of this movie i just think it's improv that goes nowhere it's just awful i don't think that it was product placement because they didn't hone in on the logo and show people eating them fair enough so crystal then gets inside whiskers and scares grumpy cat who kind of jumps in her arms. jesus christ you scared the hell out of me yeah and peas no you scared the <laughs> piss out of me meanwhile zach and donnie surprise george our security guard and he's oh boy look at these guys and they wrap him up in a chair with duct tape uh -huh. and they're like uh hey we gotta get the keys to the pet shop we're the master keys and so they find those and then they take off singing rock and roll yeah like all this is so cheap like the set design everything just looks bad and so we go back to grumpy cat who's like boy crystal really fucked up her wish it's like this whole bit about like why wouldn't she ask for unlimited tuna and there's this a, a complete family guy cutaway yeah where it's just a butler spoon feeding tuna to grumpy cat and grumpy cat being like more more until i pass out or it's just tremendously unfunny <laughs> We're outside the pet store and Zach, the stupider of our two slightly wet bandit Euro trash rockers. Zach is posing the question to Donnie, David Lee Roth, Gary Shiro, or Sammy Hagar. And I was secretly hoping this was an Mary F. Kill situation, but he just wants to know who is the best lead singer of Van Halen. What, who is your fuck Mary Kill of those three? We can't tease the audience like this. Like we can't bring it up and not answer the question. I'd fuck David Lee Roth. I'd kill Gary Sharon. And I would marry Sammy Hagar, the Red Rocker. He seems stable. Uh, see, I, do, I mean, we agree on David Lee Roth. Clearly, he's the good lay. So fuck David Lee Roth, because he's going to be a wild cat in bed. <laughs> and I don't want that around for years to come. You, you don't want to murder him because David Lee Roth is a, a national treasure. But you don't want to live with him either. So it's got to be just a weekend in Hawaii. I just can't imagine how much spandex one closet could hold. Right. Well, going to fuck. Ha! You know, and you are in for it. I would kill Sammy Hagar, marry Gary Sharon. Well, now we've learned a little bit about one another. We have that we would both fuck David Lee Roth. Or have him fuck us. Whatever. I would imagine that's how it would go. If I had to put money, if I had to put <laughs> Vegas odds on this, it's that David Lee Roth would be like, lay down. Ha! <laughs> Skibbity bop! So Donnie and Zach, they go into this pet store because they're going to steal JoJo the million dollar dog. Why wouldn't Marcus, the pet store owner, take this dog home with him at night rather than leave him in a cage at a mall pet store? It's a million dollars. I would sleep with that dog in my bed. I would hug. Just, oh my God, you, you feel like furry money. So these two steal JoJo. And Crystal, who doesn't do anything to really stop this, she's like, we can't let him steal JoJo. Too late. And Grumpy Cat says, let him steal that sorry ass dog. He's a jerk off. And then Crystal, she picks up the phone to call 
I'm guessing the cops, but the phone in the pet store is dead because I'm assuming Marcus hasn't paid those bills either. And then Crystal finds the keys that Donnie and Zach left behind when they ran off with the dog. Important plot point there. Mm -hmm. Grumpy Cat gives us two scenarios of how our movie could end. The first scenario involves Crystal and Grumpy Cat leaving the pet store, followed by Crystal pedaling her bike with Grumpy Cat in the basket against a green screen. And then they go to the police station, alert them of the crime. The two bad guys are arrested. Movie's over. If and only if, Bo, that's how this ended. Instead, Grumpy Cat is like, but that was bullshit. Here's what really happened. And it's Crystal saying like, hey, we've got to save the store because it's the only place I feel like I belong or whatever. What about the house where you live with your mom, sister aunt? <laughs> you mean Tabby? You know she calls her by the first name. Tabby? The one who went with me to get my ears pierced the same time she got her ears pierced? <laughs> And Grumpy Cat is like, you're going to be fine. Then Crystal <laughs> reminds Grumpy Cat, you know what? You've never been successfully adopted. Then we get a cutaway uh -huh. where Grumpy Cat is like, she's right. What if this happened to me? What if I was thrown on the streets like a dog? And she's like being pursued by police, hi jumping into boxes, finally being placed in a shelter. And then they take this cat puppet, Chad, uh -huh. and they just put gas over its face. They euthanize a cat. Yeah. They cut back to Grumpy Cat alive and well at the pet store. Grumpy Cat is like, that's pretty dark. And it's like, yeah, it sure is for this Christmas movie. Eh, you know, Bo, we've all been there. It's the holidays. Sometimes you get a little down and you envision what it would be like, you know, if you were abducted and put to your death. Grumpy Cat, I want to play a game. You have 60 <laughs> seconds to get the key out or we will euthanize you. At this point, we fade to black for more commercials. That happens a lot in this. Movie. And a lot and recaps on the way back because you can burn precious minutes that way. <laughs> this is the first time we fade back in because we're uh, well over halfway through this. And this is the moment where Grumpy Cat is talking to the people that have headed back over after they went to see what the hell was going on on another channel. <laughs> mm -hmm. When we fade back in, Grumpy Cat cuts a circle in the black void that is this movie. And we see framed in this round cutout, Grumpy Cat with a burn burglar's cap on and grumpy cat says i'm back bitches and i rolled around in some catnip let's go do this thing i'm totally fucking high <laughs> penelope cruz from blow so grumpy cat is now jacked up to 11 and ready to go fuck up these two crooks yeah. our idiot rockers the semi-wet bandits have stolen this dog uh -huh. and, and also like they're making jokes our grumpy cat is about like being failed rock stars and whatnot uh -huh. and i'm like who are these jokes for again who is the target audience for this i don't know and so donnie realizes that they left the keys for the car inside the pet store so they can't get away with this dog zach tries to punch a window out of the car and doesn't when this happens and i'm being generous here this felt like a home alone-esque physical comedy bit that falls flat mm -hmm. and then donnie's like we gotta go back inside and get my keys so off they go and crystal meanwhile is back at whiskers trying to pump herself up to go chase the semi-wet bandits uh -huh. and they show up Oh, shit. <laughs> hey, I was just going to look for you guys. Hey, guys, she's over here. The little girl you're looking for. Come get her. Can I have half the money? And Zach says Donnie should ask the cat. And they're kind of laughing. Who <laughs> asked the cat? And they notice that the cat's gone. Uh-huh. And then the music from the Christmas area in the mall, like where Santa sits and whatnot, starts going off. And they're like, our cat and the culprit who has our keys is now in the middle of the mall where this display is. So they go running out of whiskers to find whomever that is. Wouldn't you think if you broke into the mall to steal a million dollar dog and then you come back in looking for your keys and suddenly you hear music going off in the middle of the mall that you would be like, holy shit, we need to get out of this mall immediately yeah. rather than, ha ha, there's a culprit. Yeah, even if we have to walk this dog home, that's what we're gonna do and not go back to the scene of the crime. They chase after Crystal and scream out, stop! You think this person has your keys? I guess. Yes. So Crystal dashes into this service area of the mall and Donnie and Zach give chase with Jojo the dog on a leash. Crystal uses the master keys to enter into this sporting goods store and Aubrey Plaza offers up some random grumpy cat thoughts as they dash from aisle to aisle looking for a place to hide in this sporting goods store. And it's all not very funny. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not entertaining. <laughs> no. And then Donnie, Zach, and Jojo the million dollar dog, they show up in the sporting goods store because clearly they know where they went. And during this scene, grumpy cat 
takes her paw and reaches out to this display of fishing lures and starts patting at them, which you're like, oh, that seems like something a cat would do. Until the moment where Grumpy Cat smacks this oversized fishing lure so hard that it pierces one of the pads on her foot. And then Grumpy Cat yanks it back with such force Mm -hmm. that it pulls over this entire display, imagining the pain that this animal must feel having this hook rip out a chunk of its tiny little cat paw as this six foot rack of lures crashes down on the ground yeah it's like seeing emily blunt step on that nail in a quiet place and you're like oh no yeah oh fuck you yeah it's a real like a a sphincter tightener for sure grumpy cat's just like well look at this shit ain't this a Debbie Downer kind of a day. Anyway, let's keep running around the aisles of this sporting goods store. There's this moment where Crystal stashes Grumpy Cat in a tent and these Mm -hmm. idiots are creeping up on said tent. And then Crystal suits up like a paintball Rambo. Yeah, she hides in plain sight like scooby-doo and shaggy yeah like with the mannequins and then after she suits up like the the paintball mercenary that she is these two morons are unzipping the tent and you know ass up right. looking into this tent and crystal just starts shooting him in the ass with his paintball gun you like that didn't you i like saying it i don't know that i like watching it <laughs> but anytime you can say like oh somebody got shot in the ass with a paintball gun it's a fun string of words would you like to go ahead and ruin this scene because of what happens next yeah after shooting him in the ass then grumpy cat all of a sudden is just using some kind of crazy paintball machine gun yeah it's a cat sized paintball machine gun yeah then a windowed british version of grumpy cat flies into the frame because if it won aubrey plaza wasn't enough in this scene we needed a second where <laughs> she's like oh I don't know if I could do a silly voice with an accent. That's a level of difficulty that the Russian judges are going to ding me on. Grumpy Cat is like, "Ah, we have a production department that can make this stuff, but it looks chintzy. And none of, I can't tell if this is happening or not. I mean, it's not, but it is. And then Donnie, the smarter of our two semi-wet bandits, he's like, look, I'm going to totally kill this guy. And then he goes and he gets a compound bow and arrow and he's going to go murder this, I guess, child or small adult. And before he can complete this unthinkable task, he shoots himself in the foot with the arrow and screams out like Daniel Stern in Home Alone. And then Zach runs over and pulls the arrow out of his bro's foot. And then Crystal and Grumpy Cat, they just get away and the bad guys follow covered in paintball splooches. And then Crystal runs past the wishing well from earlier and she tosses their keys into the well, fade to black. And so when we come back from break, oh my God, Grumpy Cat typing a script called Terrible Movie She Wrote by Grumpy Fat. I mean, Cat. Ah, never mind. It's fine. This is a Murder She Wrote reference. Like, from what, the 80s weekly mystery drama series starring Angela Lansbury, an elderly woman. Mm -hmm. Like, again, who is this reference meant for? Maybe it's you and me. Maybe that's who it is. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe they wrote this for us. The era of our references and those of Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever, a surprisingly close Venn diagram. Yeah, you zoom in on that and it's you and me waving up in the air. Hey, everybody. What? Right. Spelling out SOS with the rocks we find washed up. Get us out of here. And when it comes back from commercial, we get more narration meant for people that started this movie earlier, smartly changed the channel, but then foolishly came back to see that this movie did not get any better while they were gone. What happened? Is that all? Yeah, Grumpy Cat's like, some guys showed up and they stole a dog and we shot him in the asshole with paintballs. And Crystal, that's the little girl's name. Well, she threw some keys in a wishing well. Come on, jackasses. We're going to finish this movie. And so this child who apparently is running the mall uh shows up late yeah brockman the 19 year old guy in his dad suit he shows up what time of day is it when he shows up bo what are we looking at 2 a.m yeah 1 32 in the morning i'm thinking and jojo sees him and jumps on him and he's like hey what are you doing here you're worth a million smackaroonies i'm gonna have a very merry christmas selling this dog on craigslist i'm gonna be able to really fuck over that pet store owner for no good reason <laughs> before he could do that though Dottie and zach see him and they run over and just tackle this guy to the ground oh i loved it then the dog runs 
off. Yeah, he's gone. So Zach and Donnie think that he's the guy that shot him in the ass with the paintball mm-hmm. and swiped their keys. So they're like, hey, tell me where those keys are. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Look, I'll, you can call my dad. He's going to be here to pick me up in two hours. So you can't do anything too bad to me. And then Donnie and Zach go full Suge Knight Vanilla Ice. And they flip this guy upside down and hang him over the railing of the second story of this mall. Oh my God. Oh my God. I don't know anything. I just came here to get my laptop. <laughs> I wanted to look at porn late at night while my parents were asleep. I apologize. I apologize unreservedly. So Crystal then shows up to find george all tied up and she's freeing him she tells george like hey these jerks are trying to steal this dog jojo then around the corner as she is telling him this comes jojo the dog yeah and george is like hey uh you got any idea why they wanted to steal this here dog and not uh you know diamonds from the jewelry store like i told them i mean uh like uh maybe they would want to if they were normal uh robbers and all yeah this dog is worth lots of money we should call the cops george oh yeah i wish it could uh it turns out that they took my phone and they stepped on it and threw it in the toilet there i i I just can't call anybody right now but i'll tell you what uh we're gonna get you out of here uh so let's get you right out the front door i'm gonna take care of the dog you you said it was worth a million dollars right at least a million dollars georgia i got the dog then so look you run on home and i i hope you don't die of hypothermia out there i'm not sure how cold it is so george there's a picture of you with the two guys that are stealing jojo on your desk that seems a little unusual oh no uh, you know i take pictures with people here in the mall all the time and keep them right there on my desk so uh could have been anybody really could have just a coincidence they were probably scouting a place out they were uh and i just happened to uh, like people all the time coming up to me jay george how about a selfie huh how'd that be george, why do all these magazines have naked ladies on them well that's a funny story i was pre-med uh when i first started college I had to uh, drop out uh because of the war but uh i i i've always liked anatomy and so i like to look at uh these bodies there uh and just see you know uh, where everything goes hey george your pants are not only unzipped but unbuckled oh yeah that's just comfortable for me that's just me just relaxing that's how i that's how you know that we're friends because i just feel this uh comfortable and natural which you just to uh, undo the belt there and uh, ease opened uh, the pants, so you know boxers underneath. No, uh, no, no funny business. Do the phones over here work? Nope, nope. I just stay away from there before I, uh, you get tased. Uh, you get. I don't mean by me, obviously, not your old pal George. But uh, it turns out that uh, we've had a random <laughs> uh, a prankster uh, of sorts going through and putting little electrical shockers on all oh. the the phones. And boy, I just I'd hate to see you. Like touch that phone, and what happens is the the current runs through you, and you just piss and shit yourself. So <laughs> I'd hate to see you, uh, just as a young lady, you understand, uh, in front of a a gentleman such as myself, just pissing and shitting yourself uh, like an infant. So I'm just gonna see you on outside. You're such a good friend, George. Thank you. Yeah, hey, thank you, huh? Thank you. And I'm just going to leave the pants unbuckled while I see you out, if that's all right with you. We cut back to the second story railing, and Brock was like, I don't care if you steal the dog. My my company wants the pet shop gone. We want to put a chicken hut palace in there. I'll look the other way. They don't kill this 19-year-old young man. You know, that's probably the better choice for these two, you know, not murdering a stranger. And then <laughs> Donnie realizes, hey, JoJo's disappeared. Fade to black. Uh-huh. Fade back in. And now Grumpy Cat is dressed up in some sort of robe and crown and kind of looks like the star on the top of a Christmas tree. And behind Grumpy Cat is a green screen background of this large estate. And Grumpy Cat says, some people are born great. Some people achieve greatness and others sit around and watch Christmas movies starring cats. You know which one you are, loser. Meow, 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 you jerk offs. This is the point where I was like, man, if I were watching this for any other reason than this show this would have been done grumpy cat is directly insulting you the person watching this movie grumpy cat is calling you an asshole yeah. for enjoying this entertainment a movie that doesn't like its audience that's what you're watching i can't tell you how off-putting it is when you're watching this movie it makes you feel bad as a person that you're participating in this you know crystal is walking with jojo on a leash alongside george the mall cop who has his pants still unzipped and slightly unbuckled <laughs> 
picture. He, he, he gets her out. He's like, hey, you need to get outside. Uh, I'm going to lock the door behind you. Just leave the dog with me and, and we're going to be on our way. And George says, he's like, hey, so why are you out here at 2 a.m. in the morning? Shouldn't your mom, sister, aunt be worried about you right now? And Crystal says, she's not important to the plot of this movie. I came down here to talk to the cat. We can understand each other. Oh. I can't say that about too many people, George. My dad left my mom for a barista. He doesn't call anymore. He's probably busy with final exams. You know, he started his freshman year last fall. And then George says, yeah, that sounds pretty tough. Uh, So you broke into the mall to come and talk to a cat? Look, you've got some real problems there, Crystal. And Crystal says, George, we understand each other. And then Grumpy Cat says... Look, don't get all sappy on me, sugar tits. Oh, wait, it's a Lifetime movie. You can do whatever the hell you want. I like George's take, like, oh, boy, he sounds like he got a greener banana there, huh? Got a new, better family he did, too. Well, that's exciting. You ever get a chance to see any of them? Or they? I bet they're smiling all the time. Unlike yourself, yeah, Miss Donor. I'm glad we had this talk. All right, look, Crystal, uh, when the cops show up, uh, where should I tell them that you put them keys? And then George's cell phone starts ringing. And wait a minute, Bo. Mm-hmm. George, the mall cop, I think he might be a bad guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's like, hey, what about that fucking cell phone you got, George? You just told me that. It- yeah, that cell phone, that's not That's not my regular cell phone. This is, uh, this is a backup cell phone that I never use in case of emergencies. Ah, well, that's great, because now you can call the police. You know, there's, there's the funny thing about that, um, I got this on the discount rack, and there, there are two numbers missing, and it's nine and one. So I can't really call the police. I, there's the local number. That doesn't have either of those numbers. You can just dial the local number. You know, the funny thing about it is inside the mall here, I get really bad reception. This is a, this is a Zeppo brand phone. Uh, no nines, no ones, no reception. That's their uh, that's their tagline. So it doesn't really work too very well. How much are you paying for that, that service? I, uh, I, I pay uh, 99 cents a minute. And I pay uh, uh, $20 a month activation fee. That's what the guy told me. It's a real bargain. Yeah, it sounds like the kind of phone you'd have. But he ultimately is like, yeah, Crystal, we're not calling the cops. Uh, What? If you haven't figured out by now by uh, me having my pants off in front of a child and all, uh, I'm just not a good person. George is our secret villain. (laughs) We cut back to the thieves. Then Donnie and Zach get a call from George, the mall cop, who informs his two co-conspirators that a 12-year-old girl just untied me don't you two jackasses think you'd be a little curious that i'm calling you on my zeppo phone by the way i gotta hang up i am not spending more 99 cents on this call click i'll call you back in two minutes when i'm further down the hole let you know i'll update you where i am george he's on his little scooter and he's riding through the service corridors and he crashes into donnie and zach and then all three of them are finally together and then george our mall cop he admits he's like hey look i'm the one who came up with the plan to rob that jewelry store and donnie and zach they're like hey look plans change we're gonna steal this million dollar dog at this point i'm like grumpy cat is kind of incidental to everything that happens in this movie you could remove grumpy cat from this entire film and it would pretty much go on the same way it does with grumpy cat in the movie yeah well like all the other animals in that pet store quite frankly like the pet well i guess jojo is the only animal you need for this film to work hey let's go back to the christmas party where alejandro wins best ugly sweater at 3 (laughs) a.m yeah and, and so is the speech he gives here in this scene that i forgot was even a thing in this movie until they brought it back oh you're right the christmas party is this speech he gives is it supposed to be funny as he's thanking everybody or is it yeah like does he know it's funny no no one knows it's funny because it's not funny i mean i think somebody wrote it and thought this might be funny but they might be wrong in fact they are wrong jesse and tabby are still flirting and then again because it's 3 a.m tabby's friends like you know jesse thanks for inviting me and my daughter what's her name christine Kristen, crystal speaking of which where is she and then we cut back to the mall where we see crystal and grumpy cat and jojo and then at this point they're surrounded by donnie and zach and george the mall cop on his scooter and grumpy cat narrates more of this self-aware dialogue and questions the suspense of the scene and then we just fade to black then we fade back back in i guess after some commercials and grumpy cat asks the viewing audience why are you still here why are you watching this shitty movie yeah 
Yeah, and then we kind of flash forward or something to ensure, like, Grumpy Cat is still alive in the future, but then snap back to the villains, tying up Crystal, so it's like, hey, you think they'd kill the star of this movie? Think again, jack off. Right, it's like, why why are we doing this? Anyway, you could ask that of every scene, almost. So the villains are tying up Crystal, and George is actually given his big villain speech about, like, hey, you know, all that time I was busting those uh, punks and doing all that profiling that made me so happy i i was uh actually just wanted to be out there committing to crimes and they're asking crystal hey where are the where are the keys crystal's like oh i forgot where i put them and george is like hey uh you two morons uh moron number one moron number two get out of here um <laughs> let, let me talk to the little girl alone <laughs> that's the funniest moment in this whole episode and <laughs> <laughs> this is more on number one put more on number two on the phone um look is he mad at me <laughs> look you two need to to get your heads in the game and start start paying attention to your work hey look at me hop along cassette each <laughs> <laughs> so help me sydney if you say a fucking word i'm gonna stab you in the heart with a fucking pencil oh shit all right hold on <laughs> <laughs> he's like leave, leave me alone with crystal for a minute uh he's like look crystal i know those guys were asking you where the keys were but i mean really where are the keys bent over and i'll show you fat man you're right get bent pig and george is like look you're right i'd never hurt you crystal you're you're a good kid but i will hurt this ugly cat i really have no qualms about that this thing is kind of an abomination so i i i'd really think i'd be doing the world a favor george is like you know I'm going to put this fucking thing in a trash compactor. I swear to God, Sydney, I'm going to put this fucking cat in a, in a trash compactor. <laughs> Unless you tell me where those fucking keys are. And Crystal is like, oh, Jesus, they're in the wishing well. They're in the wishing well. He's like, all right, you still might hurt this cat. And Grumpy Cat, of course, is like, I was never in danger. You idiots, they're still watching this movie. Oh, how about I sell you some shit? And it's like unveiling a new product line. There's pillows and underwear. And at this point, it's like, hey, here's the URL. Grumpy cat, whatever. dot com. <laughs> Again, another reminder of like, oh, this is all just a giant commercial for this meme. For I guess. something, for just crap. Yeah. And so, anyway, enough of all that. George is telling Crystal, like, you're gonna stay right here. I'm gonna take the dog. We're done, Crystal. And so he he takes JoJo, and this prompts Grumpy Cat to say, and that's how the movie ended and there's this false ending because we're doing all kinds of stupid shit like this in this movie where we see george <laughs> laughing you know and marcus being extorted getting the dog back the band of zach and donnie they buy a tour bus and and go on tour george retires and just fishes all day marcus has to close the store and cries every day then grumpy cat interrupts and is like i lied and then summarizes everything again and says everything is terrible they fade to black and then they fade back in on the pet store where Crystal is still tied up and Grumpy Cat just sort of sets the stage with more pessimistic narration about how Crystal's lost faith in all humanity and don't look at me to motivate her. That's the job for a happy cat. And then Grumpy Cat's head pops into frame surrounded by a Christmas wreath alongside this orange and white tabby cat that has its mouth open in a smile, which is also surrounded by a Christmas wreath. If you cut out all of these interjectory asides which aren't funny you would shave a good 20 minutes off this film's runtime and make it about three times better grumpy cat decides to help crystal because crystal is crying and moping about how i try to make friends but i'm such a loser and i thought george was my friend and george for the back is just like hey just uh yeah, let's set the record straight there i was never your your friend crystal you're kind of a weird kid <laughs> he says that he tells this little girl he's not her friend yeah. and then grumpy cat, grumpy cat says you know what crystal you're a good person you're full of love and then crystal says what's good of having love if nobody wants to give it back and then grumpy cat gives crystal a pep talk that by crystal's own admission she says you're making me feel worse <laughs> Yeah, and well, because Grumpy Cat's whole tact is like, look how beloved you are by all these mall people. <laughs> they 
They're the worst. There's the Cinnabon guy. And there's the guy over there who cleans up vomit. And the other guy who runs the train for children. You know, they all love you, Crystal. And Tabby, whose relationship I'm unclear about. Your mom loves you. Taco guy loves you. That other guy loves you. You know, that guy. At this point, Grumpy Cat says, You know what? I'm adopting you for Team Grumpy, Crystal. And so are all the other animals in this pet store. Is that going to make you stop blubbering and <laughs> snotting all over the place? And then we pimp out more Grumpy Cat merchandise um, as all the other animals call bullshit on the shameless plugging of t-shirts and hats. Yes, and then Grumpy Cat makes a prayer to fate. Like, fate, I don't pray to you often. I have not the tongue for it. Uh, that's of course Conan the Barbarian. Grumpy Cat wraps this up with some sort of watered down William Wallace speech. And then Grumpy Cat runs around and starts opening up all of the cages of the animals as the theme from the A-Team plays. Yeah, it's a real and, surprise. And then the Jack Russell Terrier says, it's clobberin' time. I, I'm like, what in the hell is happening in this movie? Yeah, it, it's, I don't know. I don't know, Chad, but George uh, calls his mom <laughs> from the pet store uh, where he apparently didn't see any of this happen. No, not at all. And he's just like, yeah, mom, look, I got to ride home. Yeah, you don't have to come pick me up tonight. Okay, mom? Mom, are you listening to me? I swear to fucking God, mom, if you show up here unannounced, I'm going to fucking stab you. Anyway, but <laughs> there's all this business about her like making roast beef and maybe inviting somebody home. And he's like... Mom, look, I just got to get off the fucking phone. It's just chaos over here. And then he reaches to grab something off the shelf, but what he grabs is a snake, right. which he throws, and there's an ADR, wee, that, <laughs> that actually made me laugh. And then Jackie the Jack Russell Terrier bites George in the dick. <laughs> For a very long period of time. Yeah. J oh, geez, you motherfucker fucker brain nipples <laughs> then he came, finally gets the dog off of but it tears his pants and there's a heart boxer shorts because of course oh hey look normally i'm the one who's making this happen but a little dog over here ripping off my pants and making my cock and balls pop out that's an unexpected surprise crystal come see this normally i got a coat over this uh and then i just opened a coat up and you know there i am but this is <laughs> unexpected to say the least it, she does come over and she she is going to fight him with a rake or something. But he immediately is just like, give me that. And just takes it away from her. There's no suspense of this at all. No, he's just like, listen, you assholes, you a bunch of animals. And there's one 12 year old girl here. I swear to God, I'm going to kill all of you with this rake. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm about to walk out of here with this dog. One of you so much as looks like he's going to follow me. <laughs> I'm going to come back in here and I'm not going to kill the one that tried to follow me. I'm going to kill two of the others. <laughs> All right, do I make myself fucking clear? And if I if I hear anything other than Crystal, I'm going to kill y'all with this fucking rake. <laughs> George leaves, but he's left behind his phone, we see. That he was talking to his mother because when he grabbed the snake, he, the arms went up and, and his phone went went rolling. But Crystal is still tied up and all. Luckily, her mother's phone number doesn't involve a nine or a one. <laughs> right, or reception. So <laughs> at the party, speaking of Tabby and Jesse and their sordid romance, they're doing kazoo caroling, which sounds like the worst idea I've ever heard. Yeah. It's one of the worst Christmas-related ideas and that is a high bar. The only idea that's worse than that is going to a Christmas party. Right. <laughs> and yes, yes. And Tabby and Jesse almost kiss, but Crystal fucks that up for Tabby once more. Well, it's 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> right. Mom, I'm hungry. Where are you, honey? I'm in the mall food court. <laughs> yeah. Crystal is just like, I'm thwarting criminals. And Tabby is just like, yeah. What? Huh? Honey, it's loud in here. There's people. You're in the other room. I just saw you like 15. Oh my God, is it 3.30? Yeah, this is the first time she doesn't know her child is not at this party. <laughs> You're right. It's got to be sun's coming up. Sky's getting gray. She and Jesse take off to go save her child in a last ditch effort to. I'm not going back to jail again. Whatever you do, don't call Child Protective Services. They know me. When I divorced her father, I was playing him for a sucker. I never thought I was going to end up with a kid. I was just trying to get child support that I would never give to her. I wanted some palimony. Grumpy Cat, by the way, pops up in a bubble uh, and, and is like, 
the plot's really coming together. And then we go to break. Fade back in, and now Grumpy Cat is dressed up like a safari guide, and we see footage of hippos fighting. Uh huh. And then we get a recap of the last 10 minutes of this movie. Uh huh. It, it, this is truly all for people that abandon earlier and just foolishly return to see how this thing wraps up. <laughs> Yeah, and so Crystal and the gang are heading off to save the day. Meanwhile, Zach and Donnie are once more ass up in the wishing well. Right. And George passes by and is like, hey, more on number one and more on number two. What the fuck are you doing into wishing well? And then Zach tries to grab George's dick from that big hole in the pants that that Jack Russell Terrier ripped. Right, he just smacks his hand away, puts his finger in his face, is like, hey, you ever try to touch my goodies again? So help me God, I'm going to put you in that fucking wishing well right now and you're never coming out again. You know what my fondest wish will be? To see the light in your fucking eyes go out. Our three bad guys and Jojo the dog, they leave the mall. And George says, hey, look, I'm going to the airport. You two idiots, you got to go exchange the dog for the money from the buyer. I'm sure that deal will be met absent of any skepticism or undercover law enforcement involvement, all right? So then the movie at this point just says, fuck it, and just gives up. (laughs) Yeah. And then (laughs) Crystal looks over at grumpy cat and they see this red convertible that's parked in the middle of the mall crystal and grumpy cat speed away grumpy cat is driving yes and crystal says how could this be happening you can't reach the pedals and then the car stalls and grumpy cat says all right that shit never happened and it's like wait we have discussed the unreliable narrator on this podcast before Mm mm-hmm Good examples include, you know, Fight Club or arguably usual suspects. It can serve as a device where you present one reality and then you juxtapose that against a latter revealed separate reality. This movie doesn't do any of that. It's just a bunch of cobbled together nonsense. Yeah, the the other example I would use, or the alternate take on that, I think, is like the Michael Haneke movie, Funny Games. A movie about uh, some a couple of guys who show up at a family's vacation home, and although seemingly normal, suddenly take over the family and bind them. It's kind of a home invasion sort of movie. But there's a point in the film where the family gets the upper hand and they defeat the home invaders. Okay. And the home invaders then say, or one of them, looks at the camera and says, well, that's not very much fun. And then the the movie rewinds to the point of the attack. And this time the villains win and the movie ultimately ends with them murdering this family and leaving and the idea of the film is that oh this is what the audience came to see that uh, uh, the audience themselves are complicit in the violence of the film by the desire to see that violence played out in film i think in much the same way chad that the grumpy cat's uh worst christmas ever is in many ways making us, the audience, complicit with the film by continuing to watch it. I agree with that. I don't understand why this movie is half in with this Grumpy Cat narration. Why not just make it crazy insane or keep it between the lines? Like, make it 100% believable, like, you know, kind of like one of those Dr. Doolittle movies, or just make it bonkers. And the thing that really kind of undercuts that idea of, like, let's rewind the movie is immediately after it's Crystal taking the Camaro instead of Grumpy Cat. And when Crystal says, hey, there are no keys, Grumpy Cat is like, look under the visor, jackass. Right. And they fall out and Crystal's like, how did that happen? And Grumpy Cat says, because it's a movie. And you're like, well, that's just the thing you were saying. You don't have to keep telling me that. If you're going to do this, there's a way to do it. And this movie fucks that all up and so now crystal is at the wheel they're racing through the mall all blues brother style Uh and then right before they're gonna bust through the doors of the movie again stops to tell you how shitty it is yeah because crystal has to slam on the brinks and then go and open the doors of the mall to allow the car to pass through we don't have the kind of budget to crash a camaro through glass doors get your head out of your ass audience that's what grumpy cat pops up in a bubble to say and then then, yeah and then they take off after opening the doors and stopping the movie dead in its tracks tabby and jesse show up to see this chase happening because they have speaking of having no relevance to the film they just show up and crystal and the villains are now 
chasing each other kind of through the parking lot until we come to a moment where the cars are pointed at each other before they hit the accelerator in a game of chicken there is a stare down and the movie goes letterbox right and grumpy cat says we need better music for this and then kind of a synthy score starts playing and grumpy cat is like no fuck that and then it's an Inyo morricone score like good the bad and the ugly kind of thing the cars race toward each other and at the last minute the villains swerve and they crash into like this guard shack looking thing uh-huh. and the movie freezes and grumpy cat pops up again and is like we did have enough money to destroy that piece of shit yeah and then crystal almost runs into a christmas tree but hits the brakes hard enough to send grumpy cat flying out of the car and into the tree violently smashing into the tree and you're like whoa did they just kill grumpy cat oh if only crystal gets out of the car talk to me grumpy please you're my only friend right and grumpy cat is just like meow 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 wait a minute i can't understand your words all i can hear you say is the word meow just kidding i just want to see you freak out and have an existential crisis oh thank god i can still hear your voice i'm normal again i mean meow shit just kidding (laughs) meow So then Grumpy Cat (laughs) pops back into frame on top of the movie where Crystal is there with Grumpy Cat. And in this sort of like layered dual cat, Grumpy Cat says, like lifetime executives would miss a sequel with the Internet's biggest cash cat. Little did Grumpy Cat know that Grumpy Cat would be dead in a few weeks. Anyway. (laughs) Right. And also kind of nobody cared. I felt really bad for the cat in this movie. There are so many scenes in it where I'm like, this just feels like a feline Judy Garland, you know, (laughs) those early years. Like they're just like shaking the cat around and poking it to make its eyes bulge more. (laughs) Oh, just give me a couple of pills. I can make it. Grumpy Cat doesn't look grumpy in this movie. It looks sad. What? I can smile. I can dance. I can sing. (laughs) Come on. uh, Give me a chance. (laughs) Meow, meow. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know how that Judy Garland impression turned into Liza Minnelli so quickly and then just indecipherable (laughs) gibberish. The cops show up and arrest everybody. Uh Marcus Crabtree shows up, you know, because it's 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning and takes Jojo the Million Dollar Dog. Jesse and Tabby run over to check on Crystal and Tabby says, those guys didn't do anything to you, did they? Implying sexual assault. Yes. And then Grumpy Cat says, that's a different type of lifetime movie, sweetums. I mean, come on on now movie it's gross yeah yeah like i know we had open pants jokes that, but that was on us this movie <laughs> yeah. introduced pedophilia into our christmas lifetime movie hallmark would never pull that kind of stunt tabby the mom sister aunt bff she says you were driving a camaro and crystal says yeah but it was the cat's idea and then tabby is like is this the cat that you said talks to you and she's like, I knew you wouldn't believe me. You're the worst mother, sister, aunt ever. I'm going to go live with my father, brother, uncle, and his new wife, daughter, niece. See, my eyes in this scene are on Jesse, who's just like, what the fuck am I getting into? What's going on? Is she talking to a cat? That's your worldview where you're like, Mm-mm, nope. Right. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Uh, I'm got, I'll tell you what. Wh- Christmas morning, right? We're going to hang out Christmas morning. I will definitely be there. Don't even worry about it. If you text me all day, I might miss those. I might, it might be a little while before I respond. My mom's coming into town. Also, just to let you know, I've been driving really fast and crazy lately. So if you hear from somebody that I had a car accident and died, not the craziest thing you might hear that day. <laughs> But yeah, so a couple of things I really like about this resolution in terms of it being terrible. Marcus is like, hey, you're a hero, Crystal, for saving the day. I'm going to make you employee of the month in lieu of like pay and prosecution. Right. And then dunks on Corbin, the the shitty employee who's not there. Right. Who pops up in a little bubble and is like, hey, which again, I think is maybe one of the better jokes of the movie. I didn't remember that. I I quit paying attention at this point. (laughs) I was so disappointed in my life choices finishing this up. Right. And at this point, there's like two and a half minutes left and you're like, what the fuck are they doing for two and a half minutes? We're done, right? For God's sakes, we're all done now, right? Right. And then there's the quick cut inside where we see the teenage child tied up to a candy cane. 
Yeah, our 19-year-old Brockman. Yeah. Hello? Anybody? Is the mall going to open soon? I got to pee. Never mind. And then, Chad, Christmas morning comes. Uh And Crystal, this ungrateful little fuck, is just throwing presents hither and yon Uh because she can't find the one with Not what I'm looking for. (laughs) Right. None of these are cat-sized boxes. This is garbage. Your gifts are shit. And then when her mother slash sister Tabby is like, hey, what are you? Like, I know I shouldn't be drunk, but I was putting some stuff together last night. And mostly I mean a hangover. But (laughs) she says... Oh, wait, look, here in this basket, Grumpy Cat! And (laughs) Tabby brings her this basket. Grumpy Cat's excited. Everybody's reunited. Jesse shows up with coffee and is, like, feeling it out a little bit. A little bit. You know, it's like, all right, uh, is everybody cool? Like, how are you feeling lately there, Crystal? You still talking to that cat a bunch, or what's happening? Tabby creepily (laughs) says to her daughter, looks like Santa Brummy pressed two. (laughs) it's so gross i'm totally fucking that guy mom we need to have boundaries yeah i need a mother not a best friend aunt sister (laughs) yeah oh sorry i thought we were gonna compare compare later after the mom says Looks like Santa Bravia pressed too. Um, Grumpy Cat says, the coffee or the elf? And then Crystal laughs out loud and she's like, oh, good one, Grumpy. Right. And then Tabby and Jesse look at this 12 year old girl with confusion and worry because she's <laughs> clearly someone who needs professional help. Like that is no bullshit. In this movie, one of the last shots is the concerned adults looking at this child. Talking to a cat like, oh shit, she hadn't said anything like that out loud in a while. I thought this was getting better. Oh, this is going to cost us. (laughs) We got to get to the bottom of this before it turns out that she's killed one of the normies that wandered into the mall. Like, let me show you my cat that talks, but back here in the hallways, you know. I know where all the service tunnels are. Do you want to go up into the air conditioning vents? You can find all kinds of loose change. Uh, Those mall sub levels just chock a block full of like discarded mollies that couldn't make it in public that they've thrown down there like the other people from us just eating rabbits and shit down there <laughs> we finally get a scripted ending that says the end and then russell peters santa he shows up and says ho 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 and then a giant tree ornament with grumpy cat inside crashes into frame like a wrecking ball and he's like beat it tubs yeah fat ass and then grumpy cat sings made up lyrics to jingle bells that i won't repeat and then we bring back characters we didn't care about or barely even remember when we see the three mean girls and they're all stitched together in a single shot and you see them opening a christmas present and they get cold for christmas and they all scream out like the bitches that they are yeah and then that's that's the that's grumpy cat's worst christmas ever (laughs) it's it's a real piece of crap. I don't, man, I, is it the worst thing we've ever, I mean, the debate can be had. It's close. If it's not the, <laughs> I, I don't know, man, that cousin Eddie. That's really bad. I mean, no getting around it. I can still taste that one in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, like a fart in an elevator. <laughs> But as far as what we've seen this season, like A Very Nutty Christmas, again, not a great movie by any stretch, but totally inoffensive, totally understandable. Unlike this, which is completely offensive and thoroughly understandable. Yes, exactly. Exactly, Chad. Like, this is the thing that's like, man, somebody needs to take a punch for this. You know, I don't know who it is. I don't know who in the creative chain made all these terrible, terrible decisions, but somebody needs to get sucked right in the jaw for it. Can you imagine screening this movie for whatever executive at Lifetime? You know, they had to just be like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> right. What? How much money did we give you? <laughs> you made this piece of shit. No, there's not going to be a sequel. Can we get Opry Plaza back to re-record some of this stuff? We can't. We, the contract does not allow for that at all. Okay. All right. I guess that's what we got then, people. Ship it. <sighs> you know, Bo. Yes. When I think about Lifetime movies, Uh having now seen two of them, Uh I think about not just the holiday films, but I think about thrillers. Oh, sure. Or movies about, like, stalkers. Mm -hmm. 
or obsessive lovers, mm -hmm. you know, relationships that start somewhat romantically but turn dark and twisted. But I also like the holiday stuff. Sure. Which is why, Bo, I'm going to give you a surprise holiday episode of Pick 6 Movies. It's also a Lifetime movie, and it's also a thriller full of stalkers and obsessive lovers in a little movie called Dear Santa. Chad, this is one of those that, unlike the KFC film, uh -huh. uh, people said when uh, we talked about doing some Christmas movies, I heard people say it, hey, I I'm disappointed that Dear Santa isn't on the list. Right. And enough people said that. Yes. That we were like, all right, let's take a look at Dear Santa. And then uh -huh. we saw it. Yep. And then we said, it's going on the list. This is... The craziest damn psychotic thriller slathered up with holiday cheer that I've ever seen. It's shockingly crazy. And I think it'll be a nice turn into the last three films of this season, which are going to be completely full of deviant behavior absent 100% of holiday cheer. Yes, the back nine of this season is sleazy. Oh, just, just you wait. Just you wait. Come 2021, people. Pick Six Movies is coming hard in 2021. Start Starting off strong with thrills and chills and... Ugh. You're going to need to take a shower after these last three. So come back and see us very soon. Check your stocking and see if you have a Christmas surprise. As always, like, rate, review. Send us an email. PickSixMovies at gmail.com. We're floating around social media. If you like this episode, tell a friend. Leave us a review. If you have an idea for a season, send it our way. We are always open to ideas and suggestions. Bo, as always, any final thoughts on Grumpy Cat's worst Christmas ever? Yeah, this is an atrocity. No one should ever see it. Uh, I hope never to 